Welcome to Exandria Unlimited. My name is Brendan Lee Mulligan. I'll be your GM for this calamity. Oh. Throwing to our friend, Marisha Ray. Oh, oh my oh, goodness, already. that was wow. such a quick opening. Calamity. Thank you for that smooth and seamless toss, Brennan. <laughs> Today, oh I have a little bit of <laughs> merch to present to you. Uh -huh. um, okay, so from our Beauty of Exandria, the Wilds collection, <laughs> we have a, a Critical Role reversible bucket hat. Yeah. Hey. Oh, Look yeah. at that. When you go on the other side, it's got a little. Amazing. It's oh, got a little. It's like two hands. <laughs> Oh look! See, look, look. Oh, and then it's got so you know, oh, mm -hmm. it's got so the far, little. So far, tag. you've been talking about merch four times longer than Brennan's opening. <laughs> <Thanks>. <laughs> we have a toss pattern illustration by Savannah. Nope, that was for that. That's the toss pattern illustration. Moving on, we have the Critical Role watercolor <laughs> logo T-shirt. Wow! Yeah. Okay. Is this going well? Is this good? Yeah, this yeah, is, this good? is about okay, good. as par for the course, really. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> well, shucks, gang. Uh, I'll elaborate, I guess, a little bit. Uh, welcome to Exandria Unlimited Calamity. Calamity. Uh, if you were expecting a fun one, you're not getting one! Uh, this is a story of grief, betrayal, loss, and the panic of the coming of a new age. Calamity! Wow. <gasps> Oh no, that's right. We're doing a prequel series. Uh, we also have some uh, some new faces uh, uh, to, for the first time. Uh, I'd like to introduce some people that have not been at the table before. Uh, first, uh, Mr. Lou Wilson. Oh, yeah. 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 What a thrill, it's so nice to be here. <laughs> Get low. Hi. Get low. Hi, table. <laughs> uh, and Mr. Luis Carrasso. Yeah. Hey. Um, I don't know. I feel like I should hug the table too. Yeah. It's sort of hey, it would be appropriate. Yeah. Yeah. Should I hug the table? Peer the pressure. Table. It works on me. <laughs> Um, he back. He won't see. Yeah. Uh, incredible. Well, uh, we are going to be telling a story of a different age in Exandria, an age long past. Rumors and legends abound of this time period in the world. This is prior to any vestiges of divergence, prior to the coming of the Divine Gate and the departure of the deities into realms beyond Exandria, you will find no Taldore in this version of this world. What? For indeed, it has not yet received that name. It is known by its elven name, Gwasar. Wow. We journey to an age long ago to tell a story, perhaps, of a more sorrowful and bitter time. Shadows stalk this world. Come with us, but please, only if you dare. Whoa. Please, I can't stress enough, only if you dare. <laughs> uh, without further ado, uh, a pleasure, an honor. I couldn't be happier to be here. What an incredible table. Let's have so much fun telling a sad, sad story. Uh, thank you all for watching. Let's get ready for tonight's episode of Critical Role.
fire. Oh. Everything feels slow. There's movement and there's heat, but the only noise you can hear, despite all this chaos, is breath. It's yours, but it's also a stranger's. There's, it's like someone else is using your body to breathe. You're stumbling. Luis. I need you to describe your character and tell us your character's name, but I would love for you to do that with the understanding that your mouth is filled with blood. All right, well, uh, uh, my name is Xerxes Iletas. I'm six feet tall, I'm a paladin. Broad-shouldered, muscular, dark hair, wavy, medium tan brown skin, amber eyes with mm, a kind of troubled, sometimes emptiness behind them. And uh, I imagine right now he's stumbling around, uh, wiping the blood off of his mouth as he's trying to maintain his sense of his surroundings. You've been here before. Uh, you're, you're in a state of disorientation. It's combat. Uh, you're not dead. Maybe the blood in your mouth isn't your own, but you've just received a massive blow somewhere to the head. Not lethal, but you're off balance, you're stumbling. Something is wrong, and not in the sense that you're in a bad situation. If anything, that's a place of comfort for you. Something is wrong in the spirit. You open your eyes, everything is moving through liquid glass, time is as slow as can be. Ahead of you, you're seeing shapes swim into focus as your eyes reconnect. You can feel your legs doing their work underneath you. It's so slow, and again, ringing off the inside of your helm, your own breath, sweat pouring down your brow. Ahead of you, the shape comes into focus from blur into three swimming shapes that you realize are the same wall. It's a wall, it's a building. There's something happening, there's fire, there's an orange glow that has turned the white marble of your city into a hellscape. <gasps> there is a burst of energy, an explosion. Mm. It moves so fast out to a radius of 10, 15, 20 feet, and then joins the glass time that you are in. Boom, <gasps> slow. You feel yourself lifting off your feet, being blown away slower than you have ever moved in combat. What are you doing? Uh, I am trying to find the people that I know. I'm looking around as I'm being blasted slowly through space through the air, I'm, I'm trying to find anyone. Twisting and turning my body. Do I see anything? Someone you know. You look through the streets as you move. <laughs> Two more explosions. They start so fast and get to only a certain point and then whoom, slow again. You're watching moments in time disconnected. Someone you know. Down a street, maybe it's a street you recognize, could have been a street you walked on the first time you came to this city. At the end, there's an open plaza. You know at the center of that plaza, there's supposed to be a statue. 
and you know who that statue is of. Instead, there is open space. You see a boy, five years old, a red shock of hair. He sits with his feet dangling in the opening, a humble fishing rod in his hand, sinking into the blackness of the void in this space. Mm. I need to get to him. I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try to uh, use whatever I can with my body and kind of twist and try to guide my body in that direction if I can. You move, you feel your feet come underneath you and you start to hear noises. Two arms, two arms! Avalir, rise! Those noises fade and you begin to move and you feel coolness coming from that opening. You arrive and the orange glow still hangs in the air, but suddenly the glass goes away. You're moving under the power of your own body and you feel your sense and your memory return to you. You catch your breath and once again, that sound does not sound like a stranger to you. You are in the plaza and can walk freely and you are still looking at the child before you. Is there still chaos happening around me? Doesn't feel like it anymore. As you've moved back into a place that seems to have the power of your own body mm -hmm. underneath it, mm -hmm. it's almost like that slowed time is left behind you. You don't see any more things exploding. It's almost like the city has become still here in this place, as though everything else is momentarily subsided. I, uh, I wipe my mouth, look at my hands. Blood dripping off your gauntlet. Still there. I start to approach, but from a little bit of an angle, and I keep my eyes locked on the child. Is it Elias? Your son turns to look at you. Hi, are you okay? I'm okay, can you come to me, please? You Elias, said... come here. I'm fishing. I'm trying to catch something. What are you trying to catch? I don't know. I don't know the kind of fish that live in a place like this. I'm approaching. You look, I'm looking around. You look around. You look into the hole, expecting to see only darkness, and you see stars. Through the hole, looking straight down, you see endless stars. And they're stars you recognize, the stars over Kath Moira. You feel and hear whispers, laughter, and I need you to make a perception check. First roll of the campaign. First roll, First roll of the campaign. You got this, you got this. So this is how it's gonna be, Brennan, you son of a bitch. <laughs> it's not called EXU fucking party time, okay? <laughs> Can we, is it too late? <laughs> <laughs> we, 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 come on. Come on. We're only like five minutes in. <laughs> First roll. Okay. 13. Lucky 13. 13. <laughs> That's what they say. Oh, it's an open! No! It's an open. It's all. Way to go. Um, it's the way to go. These are the dice that y'all just gave me, too. Oh, yeah. These are my, like, newest um, Xandria dice. <laughs> um, you, on a 13, you look and see stars. And, and 
sense starts to come back to you. These are the stars you learned to fly by. And behind you, you feel a sudden reassuring presence. And you feel a massive winged shape appear behind you. A griffin formed of starlight and pure magic nuzzles against your armor. I uh, instinct instinctively just lean into him and uh, touch his beak. Griffins are, of course, half eagle and half lion. In a very cat-like way, your griffin nuzzles your armor and turns into a massive puddle like cats are wont to do. Vroom, lies down, talons in the front crossed, nestles down. Elias looks up. Are you listening for something? You hear whispers. On a 13, I need to ask you, do you speak Draconic? I do not. Oh. <laughs> That's the end of the campaign. Um, you do not. So all you hear is, I there no Cordranis, Cordranis. Do you, do you hear that, Elias? Do you hear that? Do you hear anything? Dad, you sound crazy. Is everybody okay? Come here. <laughs> he goes, okay, but, and you see that he takes the little fishing pole and puts it in between the talons of the griffin. Uh -huh. So it's just uh. sitting there, and he gets up, what's wrong? And I, uh, I kneel down, and I just, I look at him, and I uh, move the hair that's in his forehead off to the side, look in his eyes. I'm just glad you're safe. Of course I'm safe. You never let anything happen to me. I would never let anything happen to you. I'm gonna look back down into that pond. <laughs> Endless stars. Godranus. I'm gonna repeat that back into it, even though I don't know what it says or what it means, Godranus. You repeat Gordranus back into the pool. Gordranus, I say it again louder. Elias holds your arm. Dad, you know I won't look like this when you get home. I know. Wait, come back here. Dad. No, 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 don't leave. Just let me have this. He holds the fishing rod. I think I caught something. <gasps> he disappears into the pool, and you hear <gasps> the entire neighborhood in front of you vanishes <gasps> as a body the size of a mountain crashes into the city. <gasps> a massive red form writhes in pain, and a face as tall as a cathedral turns to you. A flood of sanguine fluid <coughs> emerges from the mouth, and a horned figure looks at you. You look and see something older than the world look back. I'm sorry. I approach. I'm sorry. What are you? What are you doing here? What is this? My child, I fear I am too late. There are secrets they did not tell you. He opens his hand. I rush to it. His hand is the size of a marketplace. And you look, and in the center, translucent in ghostly imagery, 
You see a small tree, no taller than 10 feet. Ghostly light translucent as blossoms move from it. And you see in ghostly light projected from the palm of this giant, this red horned giant. What does um, this mean? What is this? I'm, oh, I'm sorry, you must look, he is coming. From behind you, a figure emerges in translucent white light. Could you do me the favor of describing what your husband looked like in life? Oh, oh my God. I gotta go. It's been 10 So. Yeah, when did we breathe? That, when does that come? This come? whole episode is a trigger warning. <laughs> <laughs> I'm too upset to take notes. Uh, Vandrin is uh, about 5'10". He's just a little bit shorter than I am. He's got red hair, straight, about shoulder length, half elven in appearance. He looks, if you look at Elias, our son, you're seeing the spitting image of what he's going to look like when he's grown up. Evandrin steps past you. He cannot see you, and you understand in this moment, because your husband does not meet your eyes, that this is a memory. He is not here again, and he is still gone. He holds an amulet, steps towards the tree, and the blossoms from the tree blow in his direction. For a moment, his hair sweeps behind him, mixed with the petals of this flowering sapling. He falls to his knees, clutches his stomach. I, I run to his side. I know, I know this is a memory, but I, I haven't seen him in so long, and I, I want to see his face. You turn to see his face. You see he turns up to see someone else. <clears throat> Something's wrong. The image is shattered in a searing burst of light. Mm. Another figure, tall as a mountain, all of the light, all of the fire is but a shadow in the face of the dawn. You see a gleaming golden figure land with one colossal foot on the throat of this horned figure. Press him further into the rubble of Avalir. Mm. And you see the horned figure looks to you and cries out. His hands are still out? You stand now in the palm of his hand. Oh. I, uh, uh, I reach down and I touch it. You see the you figure, you do, you feel a pulse. You feel warm blood flowing through this giant. Oh. You look up, the face of the being above you is no face. There is no warmth to the eyes. You see the pitiless, featureless glare of the sun itself. Yes. I look up at its face. Is it is it looking down in my direction? It turns down to look at you. Turn your eyes from this sinner. He is beyond redemption. What has he done? He has betrayed his kin. You see, the horned figure turns to you and says, it's all right. Xerxes, whom did we betray? I can't. No. And he, I, 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 I. stop! Oh. Boom, you hold your hand, and as you hold it up, the light of the sun leaves and is abjured. Boom! The 
horned fiend coughs, looks at you with the expression of a being that has just had its life saved and says, no mortal would do this thing that you have done. Zerk says, if you look down and see the stars, what will you see if you look up? His uh, hand is, or his fingers curled up, I know I'm in his palm. Mm-hmm. I, uh, I'm, I look at his face and I start to approach one of the fingers that are standing up probably like a pillar. Mm-hmm. And I put my hand on the finger and lean on it. And I'm holding on mm-hmm. to him. Yeah. And I look up. You see the ground? And it is fast approaching. What? And with that, you wake up. Oh, oh Dad. <laughs> I got in the wrong class. <laughs> I thought this was fresh for biology. Yeah. Right? <laughs> oh, my God. <sighs> okay, okay, okay. Cool. The first thing I do is I wipe my mouth and I see if there's blood. You're drenched in sweat. Like your sheets are covered in sweat. It's a, it, it's uh, soaked through to the mattress underneath. Um, but beautiful dawn light cascades through the window. It's another glorious morning in Avalier. Don't even notice that. The first thing I do is I reach <laughs> for something. Oh, it's the outside. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I reach. I imagine. Is this the first of these sorts of dreams that I've had? I don't think so. No. Oh. I reach over for a, a, a notebook that I have and, 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 and a, a writing utensil, and I start to try to recall that you dream as dream much journals. as I can, and I'm going to leave a dream journal. <laughs> Hell yeah. If you dream like that, you're going to leave dream journals. Yeah, that's yeah, true. You, you write down uh, the name Gordranis, which is G H O R, the first word, and the second word is Dranis, D-R-A-N-A-S. Go <laughs> uh, What's the room that, like, what is it, what, how? Where do you sleep? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Where do I sleep? <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, uh, uh, I am the first knight of Avalir, and I dwell in the tower of the first knight, but this particular room uh, it has a co- has accommodations not just for me but for uh, for my for my griffin. Mm-hmm. So it's uh, a tall tower, and uh, it's a suite. It's not that opulent. It's not that fancy. It's got a, a a large enough bed for me, and a couch and 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 all the standard sorts of things. Mm-hmm. Uh, a chair, perhaps you know, a fireplace. Uh, uh, to contemplate the <laughs> dreams I have, <laughs> so I stare into the fire. Um, but what it also has is is, is a place uh, a nearby, uh, a giant window, so that I can, uh, so Tempest, my Griffin, can can hop in and fly out of. Uh, you approach the balcony um, of the Tower of the First Night. Uh, you see, Tempest is there once again, once again, clearly a magical creature. This griffin uh, would be, in some ages of Exandria, would cause gasps and shrieks to behold something that literally has a body of cool, amethyst, liquid gemstone with stars swimming in its form and constellation. But here in the bustling city of Avalir, Tempest is but one of many wonders. And as you behold from your balcony the spire of Avalir, the city of crowns, a new morning comes, friends. Stop being cool. Like we don't remember what just happened. <laughs> the sky was the ground was there and it was coming here. Fast. You said fast. Uh, if you look up and see stars, what happens when you look down? Uh, uh, 
<laughs> to, to quote, what is it? To quote our wonderful producer Kyle Shire, it's 1979 and disco's never gonna die. Um, <laughs> we behold the age of Arcanum. Yeah. Uh, a blending of magic and wizardry, sorcery and artifice that has created an age that will be spoken of in the years to come in reverence, but also perhaps by some in disdain. But what could they disdain here in these bustling city streets? Uh, as you look down from your balcony with your griffin here, Ready, once again, you know the significance of the day that awaits you. You look down at a busy street corner, you see here the uh, massive uh, Caro Hulk, which is a quadrupedal construct with velvet benches all along its back, uh, all along its back, that a group of wizards just sit at and wait for their stop as the automaton uh, moves along in the city streets. Um, oh, man, <laughs> um, and uh, you look uh, all around you uh, and see suddenly in the tall, spiring uh, edifices of this wizard city, this testament to the power and might of mortal beings to make their own future and destiny with arcane strands, to make their will manifest on the face of Exandria. Suddenly, all around in the hustle and bustle of the morning commute, this very busy day, you see screens alight. <laughs> Huge crystals all around the city suddenly show a face. Not only crystals, but at the top of the city in a grand waterfall. Now, a waterfall this size in any city would be pretty remarkable. Avalir soars above the clouds, flying through the sky. So from whence this waterfall comes, I leave to all of you to wonder at the magecraft that could have the scintillating mists of the Porco Falls <laughs> fall beneath okay. us, um, uh, fall. And from a moment, the falls themselves, a hundred feet tall, reflect the face of Sam's character. Sam, would you go ahead and describe your character for us? Sure. Uh, wow, what face to describe? <laughs> uh, uh, I am a loquacious Seely, mm -hmm. a changeling. Uh, my, my normal, uh, or should I say at rest uh, appearance is uh, pale skin, um, white, white eyes with sort of dark uh, shading around them, white hair. Uh, in a sort of a up shock. Um, if you look very faintly on the on the sort of gray skin of my face, there are little uh, sort of veins, marbleization tendrils of of, uh, of black that, if you stared long enough, you'd see they they sort of subtly move and shift constantly. Um, he's wearing a uh, a, a gold uh, a gold jacket with uh, a purple lining. Uh, carries himself very high and mighty, um, and but uh, this is a broadcast, is it not? This is very much a broadcast. Well, uh, as loquacious broadcasts uh, to the uh, crystal columns of Avalir, uh, before he uh, begins his proclamations uh, and heralds of the day, his appearance shifts uh, slightly. The veins in his in his face sort of. Uh, drip and move, sort of like paint being drained out of a can, and are uh, replaced with other pigments and other colors. His face becomes golden, as gold as, as his jacket, and his hair becomes as purple as the lining of his jacket. He's quite a sight to behold. He, he holds in his hand, um, is, it, is it a wand? Is it a rapier? It's hard to tell. Mm -hmm. it, it's long and has something at the end of it, like a, a like Bob Barker's old microphone. <laughs> yeah! Yeah! Uh, uh, and, and he and he and he seems to speak into it and it magically amplifies his voice across across the city of Avalir. Um, uh, and whatever <laughs> arcane and mechanical means he uses to broadcast himself are, are repeated over and over with a great echo across the city. Mm -hmm. Um, that's who I am. <laughs> Incredible. Um, we see boom, 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 arcane confetti blasts into the air, heralding the morning's announcements. Um, and we see 
as Loquacious appears on all of the crystal columns and in the main screen being the massive city dominating waterfall at sort of the heart of the city, um, we see a spinning logo of the Herald's Tome. <laughs> Uh, would you like care to make the morning announcements, Loquacious? I would, but uh, but Arya, Arya, I need my copy, my copy. Oh, I Mr. Seeley, right Mr. Seeley, got you right here. Yes, sir. Here you go. Wow. Count me down. Count me down. Oh, in I, in how five. Do I, look? do I look good? Four, yes. All three, right. Here we go. Two. <clears throat> good morning and salutations, sundry subjects of the soaring city of Avalir. I am Lo Loquacious Seeley, your handsome and helpful herald. I uh, I report the news that shapes Avalier's views. <laughs> Tonight, as we all know, marks the eve of the replenishment and our return to Kath Moira, our terrestrial sister city. Remember, folks, make sure to fasten all those loose valuables and belongings tightly, <laughs> as our friends in the Navigators Guild wish to remind us that there's always a pinch of turbulence in our descent back towards Exandria Firma. And speaking of belongings, why not try Orison's Odd Tack, <laughs> the spell glue that sticks to what it's told. Uh, as Orison himself might tell you, and you, you see uh, on the screen, on the, on the crystals broadcasting this message, you see uh, Loquacious's face uh, for a moment, uh, uh, quivers and st starts to morph and dissolve into another face. His hair changes as well, um, and to the untrained eye, it would look like an edit or a, a cross dissolve. <laughs> but 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 to, but to, uh, to those who know that he is a changeling, uh, he's actually changing his physical appearance live on screen uh, to that of uh, of Orison. Uh, his skin becomes a deep red. Uh, his hair curls into curved uh, horns, uh, that of a, of a tiefling, and speaks with a totally different voice, uh, and says. Uh, hello there, I'm Orison from Orison's Odd Tack. <laughs> the trusted name in arcane adhesives for over 30 years. Check out our replenishment special, 50% off today only. <laughs> <laughs> Hop on down to Orison's. And then whew, it morphs back into uh, Loquacious Seely. <laughs> Uh, who announces, well, make ready for tonight's fireworks extravaganza uh, uh, to the Dawn's Ledge side and enjoy the parade of beasts beginning at sundown in Excelsior Plaza right outside the headquarters of my own Herald's Tome, your trusted record of renown. As the Archmages always say, knowledge is power. So pack a punch with a people's paper. <laughs> All glory to the Academy Arcane and to the proud people of Avalir. I'm Loquacious Seely saying, Seely you later. Oh. 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 Um, uh, people uh, wow. cheer and celebrate. Um, you see that uh, uh, the, news. the news, we love the news. <laughs> um, um, as that happens, you. Uh, we see Loquacious Seely where he actually is, which is at the broadcasting station. You are standing on a raised, a like 10 foot diameter solid ruby platform carved with glyphs and runes from which you can broadcast to the city. And you see that Arya comes up and says, and we're out. Thank you so much, Mr. Seely. What was it was it all right? I stumbled in the middle there. Did you think anyone saw it? No, 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 no. We get we we have a cantrip ready, so we had a half second delay and went back in and great, great. we changed and it with illusion. Some of the crystal columns in Evenloft have been down. Have they been repaired? Uh, we're still getting word for the ones back in I need those ratings. I understand. We, we, I, if you would, sir, uh, the architect Arcane. There's some there's some civic construction occurring there right now, so that's what the slowdown is coming from. But oh well, all right then. I'll if, uh, I'll take it up with her, I guess. If if you would prefer for us to, re we've been reaching out from your office and and not not getting um no reply at all. Not at the moment. Did you say that I? <laughs> that I had requested? I can show you the exact text no, that I- No, it's fine, it's <laughs> fine. <laughs> I will take it up with her the next time I see her. I don't need fire. 
Very good. Um, uh, oh, and, and a couple of things, just run through real quick on your way out. I know that you're very busy and that you have things to do today. Walk and talk, walk and talk. Um, she begins to walk through and we see the Herald's Tome. Uh, from this broadcasting station, you are able to speak to the entire city-state of Avalir and broadcast your image. However, the Herald's Tome, its print edition is the paper of record for this city. And you see a number of scribes uh, sitting on desks, sort of arcane quills moving over. Um, you see that there is an entire hall of diviners, like fact checking, going through and like crystal balls, looking into things like, you see that there is an entire screen with a map of Exandria on it that some diviners are able to like move through. And again, you see a this entire fleet of bards going back into a research library, old editions of the tome. Uh, Arya, your assistant, moves uh, with you in this place. Um, you see, she says, um, we uh, got a little bit of a bite on something. There might be a seat opening on the Octothurge. Uh, we don't know anything for certain, but we know that um, Essel Longbolt has made some noises like he might be leaving for the Magister. Uh, for the Porter's Guild election, do we still want to run that for tomorrow at the beginning of the Replenishment's festivities? It seems like it's a little bit crowded. I want, I want to make sure that uh, we have plenty of time to get all the, the attention that we need on it. We're, we'll be landing soon, right? We, yes, we'll be, we should be landing within the next 24 hours. Uh, Longwin uh, Veilhelm reached out, who's trying to get uh, Octavius Frost's old seat, and he essentially was uh, asking if there might be another sort of expose about his long history with the Porter's Guild and- Ooh, He is just such a dud, you know? I mean, like, I, we, we tried. We tried, we gave it our all at the beginning, right? But just no one wants to back that horse. So I, I, I don't, so. I, I just say that uh, the uh, airtime's all spoken for and um, that we've we've moved on and really so should he. Uh, Gwen Ten Pace walks up, who's the head of the Herald's Hall. So she's like your records keeper here and uh, comes over and holds out and says, new numbers. It looks like Monsieur Kane is pulling ahead of Arcturus. Excellent, as it should be. Of course, sir. I uh, hope she knows who put her there. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing! Uh, and you uh, walk out from this place uh, on your day. Uh, as you step out uh, from the Herald's Tome, you look out at the street um, and see another Caro help bus uh, bustling by. You're in Excelsior Plaza, which this place is thronged with people right now. Huge Carol Hulk, boom, boom. A uh, bunch of wizards riding. Carol Hulk? A Carol Hulk is a quadrupedal automaton with a bunch of benches on its back that people ride around. Okay. Uh, uh, it's like a mechanical elephant with bus. It's an elephant bus. Okay, it's a cool. it's a robot <laughs> elephant. It's a glowing robot Carol elephant Carol. bus. Cool, 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 cool. A Carol cool. Hulk. Carol. Um, uh, but you see oh, some people, uh, some people walking along. As you step out, uh, a bunch of people all sort of, <gasps> and you see a couple of them take out little sort of docents and begin to take pictures. I really, I don't have time, but. Hello, hi. Uh, <laughs> it's lovely to meet you, hi, yes. Uh, Arya steps in and says, Mr. Seeley has time only for a few autographs today. Um, uh, thank you, she, sorry, she's dragging me away. <laughs> I must go, but how about just one more? Uh, you <laughs> get another autograph sign. Uh, as you walk away, you look out and see uh, one of the Kara Hulks stops. Um, how would you travel? Do you think you would, would you uh, go all the way towards teleportation? Would you fly? Where would am you, I off to? Uh, I think uh, uh, the, the biggest thing on your to-do list today is the Feast of Amir at the Palazzo Porco. Oh, which is Later tonight. Town? Yeah, oh, okay. way up um, that, the neighborhood that would be occurring in, looking at my own lore document here, um, that would be occurring uh, in Gallimore, way up at the top. I mean, I, I feel like I wouldn't take public transportation, if, if I may. Not at all. Um, <laughs> <laughs> No, no. Uh, okay. Uh, if, there's a, if there's a private vehicle for me, that would be wonderful. Um, you see, uh, awaiting outside, uh, you see that there is a uh, sort of wearing a jaunty little robe with some epaulets and sort of like a bellhop's hat, sort of a cross between like a bellhop's uniform and wizard robes. You see a uh, junior member of the Porter's Guild, uh, not capable of full teleportation, but handy with a dimension door, goes, uh, Mr. Seeley, sir, ready? Um, 
Yes, absolutely. Hold, hold on. Let me just make sure I'm all buttoned up here. <laughs> and uh, uh, Arya, I'll talk to you tomorrow. Very good, Mr. Thank you so much. Um, uh, as you head off, you see, uh, take one last look at Excelsior Plaza and the huge emblem of the Herald's Tome above you and all that you have achieved. Um, you look out, you see the Carol Hulk takes off going, Brought to you by the Golden Scythe. <laughs> <laughs> Heads off. Um, oh, and you take one last look and see another little automaton and look around. There are n all the mortals you can see here are involved in artifice or wizard craft or sorcery or pursuing their studies as a bard, engaged in the great work of this age, and you see automatons building and reinforcing and uh, traveling. You see a, a Hadmadad, which is a basically uniformed little bright red and blue. It's a fabric construct, sort of like a scarecrow. But you see uh, it walks the streets in a little pre recorded message and it's sort of smiling, bright blue fabric head, a little stuffed sort of burlap sack goes. Get your bumba shoots, get your bumba shoots. Everyone, get your bumba shoots for inclement weather. Rain, sleet, oh. snow, there's no telling what kind of weather we might be facing. And you see a little wizard mother with her daughter walking by in their robes. And the little girl says, Mommy, what's weather? And you see. Oh. <laughs> wow. Ooh. We've got to get her in school. <laughs> I dollared. Um, and you see, you see, the mother says, don't worry, darling. Weather is something we must only contend with for a month every seven years. And um, <laughs> uh, and walks along. Bumba shoots, get your bumba shoots, Wizards of Abilene. Um And you, uh, the porter, <laughs> opens a door and through it you walk. As you walk through the door, uh, there are some questions um, as you as you move through this place. Um, you... She walks through a door. I don't see where the questions are. <laughs> I don't see where the questions are. Um, uh, uh, as you move through, you uh, you arrive uh, in this next place. You're up in Gallimore, near where you need to go. Um, the question of those crystal columns in Evenloft. Hmm. Your assistants have basically said that reaching out to oh, yes. the uh, the architect Arcane has not gone very well. Um, is there anything, where does your mind go in this moment? I mean, I could just go talk to her now, I suppose, if I have some hours to kill. You do have some hours to kill. You could go talk to her in person, absolutely. Um, you head off uh, to, go, to go find the architect Arcane, Hierophant Abjura of the College of Abjuration, your ex-wife, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Laren Coromar Seeley. Speaking of Laren Coromar Seeley, mm -hmm. um, we are going to uh, uh, cut to the depths of Avalir. We do not see the sky here. To be subterranean in a place that rarely touches the earth is a very interesting thing, but we are deep within the Meridian Labyrinth a network of passageways and arcane machinery, and we see a massive arcane engine, gleaming silver, polished to pure reflection of its surroundings and illuminated by the light of its own spell engines. And we see therein a powerful wizard. Abria, would you describe your character for us? Let's go. Lairin Koromar Seely uh, is this tall, lanky, dark-skinned elf. Uh, her clothing is all gold and highly ornate, and even here in this uh, place that never sees sunlight seems to like glow with the light of the sun. She has a, a purple cape kind of thrown over her shoulder and in her hands she's just tossing this little screwdriver and every time it hits the air it turns into a different tool and hits her hand. She catches it again as she's sort of checking over uh, her great work. Uh, looking at her face, she's very pretty and angular. Um, and her eyes glow with like this gold energy that is exactly her magic and it kind of radiates off of her. Uh, and yeah, she, the look on her face is one of both extreme focus, but also like 
that heartbeat before being distracted by something else. She's uh, focusing on everything down here. The entire heart of Avalir in her mind is hers. And so uh, you see her like mumbling under her breath as she answers a yet another sending uh, as she focuses both on this and the things that she's not looking on right now. Um, <laughs> focus, a word, at the heart of the architect arcane of Avalir. Looking at the engine in front of you, um, where does your prodigious focus now move? Having beheld the product of a long, long time of labor, even with your perfectionist eye, you are finding yourself hard pressed to find anything here that warrants enormous redrafting. It's been a moment since your fixes have felt redundant, but I'm interested in how your character approaches this. Uh, where does your focus go in the fullness of this engine? Are you looking at something internal? or has the time come to begin to think about how it connects to everything else? Yeah, now that <clears throat> this great piece is fine, I think everyone else kind of moving through here seems a little more relaxed, but that's only tensed her up more. She's waiting for a break or a flaw or just that little heartbeat of like arcane flash before something goes awry and then sort of seeing nothing and hearing nothing her mind will drift towards the batteries and where all of that energy is stored and where the connections will be made once the replenishment happens. Mm -hmm. And then the cables and tethers back beyond that that go to a place that only she knows. Reading your instruments, the Eldritch batteries hum with power. Truthfully, the auxiliary batteries have had to kick into high gear. You are storing about as much as the city is capable of holding. However, it doesn't necessarily leave you feeling fully satisfied because this is some of the oldest technology in the city and its limitations are well known to you. Yeah. Uh, a bracelet around your wrist begins to pew, pew, and the ring of masks, tiny, less than an inch tall, but of masks hanging from a bracelet around your wrist uh, begins to glow uh, and you see the face of the guild master of the Navigator's Guild glow in illusory light uh, as Akami Ro attempts to reach out to you. Uh, without looking down, I think she just sort of knows the masks by feel. She'll switch it on. Hi. Architect Arcane, how are you feeling this fine morning? I'm feeling great and don't care about small talk. What do you need? <laughs> Always a pleasure. I would hmm. say that the, uh, I just wanted to let you know that we've entered the outer horizon of the Toramunda Nexus. Mm. No inclement weather scheduled for arrival mm. 10 minutes before sunrise, so. Mm -hmm. uh, if that works for you, we can stall a little bit, but we we will be in position over Kath Moira sometime shortly after one in, one in the morning, and we'll begin our descent, and we'll, we'll take that amount of time to make sure we do it safely and slowly. But okay, um, about we should we should be terrestrial about ten minutes before sunrise. Okay, uh, that's uh, g uh, good. Um, is everything on the ground taken care? Are they are they ready for us then? Uh, the We're fine and perfect here. 
are the ground ones good? Uh, you know, I think there's always a few youths that like to sort of run around on the the receptacles before the city lands, but they'll get, <laughs> they'll get, you know. They'll move or don't. Yes, they, <laughs> you see. Move or don't. <laughs> <laughs> Got a couple don'ts in the past. <laughs> it's, right you are, Architect Arcane. It's not like they won't see us coming. That. Um, <laughs> it's a choice. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, you see, uh, uh, you hear f- footsteps behind you. What? Um, you see the uh, Aormaton next to you. Uh, no, uh, she's standing in the room. Yeah. You see Dweomer turns and says, my lady, I hear fo- approaching footsteps. Yeah. Should the veil of secrecy be enforced? Yes, please, thank you. Um, She turns and walks out, and you hear, it's me, it's me, it's me, sorry, sorry. Um, And you see a very old, kind of stick-thin man with sort of poofs of gray hair and a long, just a mustache that can be sort of that Sam Elliott at the the longest it got, (laughs) sort of reed thin, walks up, Arcane tools all around him, um, runs up um, and says, uh, uh, "My lady, uh, my lady, sorry." Uh, yeah. And this is, of course, Callum Staff, yes. right? Your chief artificer. Hi. I, I, I've just come from the Grand Geometer. Okay. Um, tomorrow, um, the apogee solstice. The, 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 the we've known for some time it was going to be as that the celestial solstice would in fact be a um, yes. a celestial. Out all the way. Sorry. <laughs> I can't, I can't believe it. And he holds a scroll out in front of you, um, and he says, you told us to alert you. Yes. Should we receive a measurement above point zero two five? How high? I open it. Point five. Oh. Oh. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Okay. Oh, great. Thank you so much. You're, uh, uh, you could... Yes. Yeah. I will have other orders for you later. For now, I need you. Don't ruin this. I have to go now. My lady? Of course. Yes. Um, and you take the scroll. Um, you see Dweomer looks and says, my lady, yeah. all will be well on your return. We shall wait until you can come back, but everything is <laughs> ready. Incredible. Uh, you, <laughs> uh, oh yeah, uh, uh, no, you fully mute, and yeah. you can hear, hello, hello, <laughs> hello? Hi, hi, uh, yes, <clears throat> is there a, an important thing? Pleasantry, I'm excited, you're excited, it's gonna be fine, is there anything else? Mm-hmm. Laren, you know, if we don't have this relationship, we don't have to force it, no, and. <laughs> I and like you a lot. I also like you, I like working with you, but this you know. Yeah. I'm. There's it's kind of hard to shoehorn the niceties in at the end. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> sort of like an asterisk now, in the text like... that goes to the footnote of mm-hmm. how are you doing? Okay, I have to go. No, truly nothing but respect. I actually do. I, I so respect it. I will. Yeah. Yeah. Well, hey, listen, we'll have a month of not having to fly this thing. Yeah. We'll have a month of not having to fly this thing, right? Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it'll be great. I gotta go. Okay. Oh. You, everything you say worries me. <laughs> no. Hi. <laughs> <I>, whoo. Uh, <laughs> and I hang up and I sprint. Um, y- you take up. Where's your first instinct to go in this moment? Uh, I just need to get to private quarters. I need to spread this out and check it against my notes. Okay. Uh, would you stay here in the Meridian Labyrinth, or would you return to your quarters? Quarters. Um, you go up, there is a permanent gate somewhere that is keyed only to your official emblem as the Architect Arcane. You move through, <laughs> appear back in your quarters. You're up in Gallimore. Yeah. Um, uh, you spread this thing out. If you want to do a check about it, you can do a check about it. But yes, please. I want to roll, I want to roll. Arcana? Second yeah, roll. give me Arcana. Oh, 17 Ooh. plus 10 is a 27. Let's go. Vote 14. Um, <laughs> feels good, it feels good. Celestial solstices are a fact of life on Exandria. They are a part of the arcane and divine environment. Um, 
every 20 or 30 years, one comes along and the veil between realms becomes incredibly thin. About every 100, 120 years, you get what's called an apogee solstice, where the orbit of the spheres, the relationship of the moons of Exandria kick in and everything aligns. And that veil becomes so thin that incredible workings of magic are possible. Now, you knew that an apogee solstice was coming, but the grand geometer specifically reads ley lines because it's been recorded in the history of Avalir, your city, your home, that some apogee solstices are powerful enough to shift ley lines, to take the arteries and veins of the magical workings of this world and reshape them. You reading the ancient lore of Avalir were able to build the grand geometer to measure the strength of a coming apogee solstice. Based on your records, based on effectively arcane psychometry and the ability to read the power of other celestial solstices from runes and holy sites in your travels all over the world. Avalir, as you know, travels on the ley lines of Exandria, flying all over, trading with a host of cities and civilizations. You were able to, do, to deduce that anything above a reading of 0 0.025 on the grand geometer would indicate that there would be some slight shifting of the ley lines. 0 0.025. You're reading 0.5. Oh. Uh, by herself in this moment, I think even as she's checking against her notes and double checking because she doesn't trust other people, she's actively weeping because she's been working towards this for so long. And it's both relief that all of the things that she's sacrificed could be worth it for this one shot, and the terror that she has so little time to take advantage of this tremendous moment. Laren is in a city of wizards, often the most cerebral person in the room. Weeping does not come often, but there have not been moments like this that deserved it. And in that moment, as you realize what is possible, a lion's head gargoyle on the door, little door knocker goes, Madam, your ex-husband is at the door. <laughs> walk over and throw open the door. Oh my god. My darling. <laughs> and I clock very quickly that we are super magic right now. Hi. Hi. You're home during the middle of the day. <clears throat> Don't you have a lot of stuff to do to land? I do. Come in. Oh, thank you so much. You see, I've been trying to reach you <gasps> through the normal means, and it seems yeah. that someone's been ignoring someone else's you know, when we separated, we said that we would try to remain friends, try to keep open clear lines of communication. Well, you know, we are we a day out the from the replenishment. Uh, yeah, what? All the more reason. Hairstyle the more check reason. do you need from me? You look beautiful. What do you need? What do you need? Well, what do you? Thank you. Thank you. I'm just saying we're going to be down there a lot, probably mm -hmm. mingling in the same uh, with the same folks, glad handing with the same people down there. If if we can't even talk amongst ourselves, then it's going to be very awkward for us. It's going to be very awkward for me, frankly, having to explain why there's this weird coldness in the room. And you know, I Are know you that you're obsessed your with your work. Social status, my problem right now. You don't have to. 
just reply to my messages. Oh, the ones from Aria? <laughs> Aria is just my assistant. Mm -hmm. I mean, she's mm -hmm. she's a fantastic assistant. She came highly recommended. I'm sure she did. She happens to be young. She happens to be attractive, but that goes with the territory. It has nothing to do with anything else. Of course it doesn't. I'm not safe on the side of the table. <laughs> of course it doesn't. You have my unadulterated attention. Well, right that now. would make the first time that's ever happened. Oh. <laughs> I begin summoning a firebolt. <laughs> um, as as you crackle with arcane energy that springs springs to your fingertips, um, you uh, uh, in between you um, you see a momentary of paper as a little, uh, and you look up and see the first of them approaching in the sky. The kites, oh. you see spell kites. Uh, you hear cries and horn blasts. Behold, behold, Kath Moira has come into sight. And far off at the edge of the horizon is the base of a mountain. You can see from the beautiful front door that overlooks the descending city, Avalier built into the peak of a mountain, which was lifted by mages long past straight into the sky, and you behold a terrestrial city, Kath Moira, which Avalier, let's be clear, geographically got the way better deal here, because Avalier gets to be on a solid mountain peak, and Kath Moira has to be a weird ring <laughs> around a seat for the city to come back and land on. Wow. So there's, so Kath Moira is a ring of a city with a giant, you know, like, three mile, <laughs> sort of just like runic flat with some like groove holes for stone columns to come in to like Ikea fix <laughs> the top of the city into. Um, uh, but you behold Kath Moira and you see filling the sky in between you and Kath Moira in the distant horizon, still far, far off, a endless parade of spell kites. Now that you have come close enough, the people of Kath Moira, families that have been apart from each other for seven years, which is the circuit of time that Avalier travels Exandria and trade and amassing its great librarium incantatum and trading for secrets and gold all across Exandria. It's come close enough that the families there can send their spell kites up, attached to beacon stones in different homes in Avalier. The kites seek them out, and the kites brightly colored with long tails of paper, carrying baskets with baked goods and flowers, flowers that can grow in the earth below, not conjured magically, but real growing things, come in a light, and in between the two of you, you see a kite coming to your home with your name on it. <laughs> In the moment that I see it's for you, I'm already back on my, uh, I'm taking other calls. Before you go, <laughs> I don't want to leave it like this, all right? I just was struck with the memory that the last time we landed, the cities, you know, that's when we got married. I remember. So, I don't know, we, we were okay once, and maybe we can be again. Just for a moment, just for the month that we're docked, and then you can go back to hating me. I don't, I don't hate you. And I will be on my best behavior. I will too. You should get that, and I should get back to work. Good luck. You grab a basket from some uh, uh, members of the Herald's Tome stationed back in Kath Moira, and as we see the kites over Avalier, so very many kites begin to approach back at Excelsior Plaza, but not to the Herald's Tome. Um, uh, no, indeed, um, uh, we find them going to the vault 
of the golden scythe. Yes! <laughs> um, there I am, shirtless, close to yes! um, <laughs> A vault is a dance club, it's a dance. okay? It's, um, there's no gold here, baby. <laughs> Not yet. Um, Drop the baby. Uh, <laughs> Uh, here in the vault, um, we see uh, countless automata um, shouting silk-dressed dress sky pirates, it seems like almost, uh, proud merchants, uh, barrels of summoning salt rolling, giant wheelbarrows full to the brim with diamonds, cut perfectly, wheeling throughout, uh, flowers, festivities. There is a bridled unicorn. Um, uh, and we see a, uh, and all of this moves, uh, and there is in the center of this chaos, this controlled chaos, this endless empire of arcane riches, we see a single man at the helm, the ringmaster of a circus of impossible wealth. Lou, could you please describe your character? Yeah. Yeah. Let's go. Uh, Nidus is, I'm gonna look at a picture of him because I always forget. Uh, Nidus <laughs> is like kind of a stocky dude, uh, like right around 5'10". Um, he has uh, long dreads uh, cuffed with gold that come and lay just on his shoulder, uh, like wearing the uh, red of the golden scythe. Like a red coat. Uh, with uh, a like gorgeous golden pin uh, with the signature of the scythe, uh, with a cape draped along his back, he wears one of those funny like kind of Renaissance merchants ca floppy caps uh, <laughs> uh, to one side. Uh, his face long uh, scar from his pirate days over his right eye. Um, I know it's on my left, but I'm looking at a picture that's the reverse. So uh, <laughs> uh, over his left, uh, over his right eye. <laughs> The viewers are also looking at yes, flipped yeah. okay. Oh, are, is it flipped for them as well? I think so. No. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, over his right eye is a scar. Over his left eye, you see three tattoo. Uh, he has tattoos of X's. He's got three uh, over his eye. Uh, a a a beard that ends in a golden ring, uh, uh, and then set in his uh, face are uh, two eyes of hazel flecked with literal gold. Um, Oh. Uh, it's expensive. Uh, Very uh, expensive uh, procedure. Um uh you see Knight is in the center of this, uh wheelbarrows moving, barrels getting rolled up onto giant carol hulks. Carol hulks that you built after all. Um and you look up and You're you welcome. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um you uh you look up and see a massive golden statue of a roaring dragon, gilded to perfection, glowering over this entrance, This the most massive central warehouse of your order. Uh, next to you, wearing sort of dull red robes with a kind of classic, like, like sort of uh, uh, arithmeticians or like bookkeepers, have a sort of conical hat, um, uh, with a sort of long beard looking a little bit dusty, is Alessander Kyrus, mm -hmm. um, your chief bookkeeper. Uh, sire, the, the words come down from the magisterium. The need was for 200 bounded wands. It seems that we've already approved that, but 100 is already exceeding the budget we set forward at the beginning of the quarter. Alessander, so <laughs> it's the replenishment. <laughs> I, I it's the replenishment, Alessander. Guildmaster, if you ask me to to keep these books, I shall keep them. But I remind you that the golden scythe is is not a consortium of wizards. We no. are merchants. Yes. I cannot produce something from nothing. We are a symbol of the riches of our city, right? And should we limit ourselves, we limit the potential of Avalir. So, Alessandra, you're going to find me in your brilliance, 100 more wants, I have no doubt. 
Perhaps I could reach out yes. to the... Yes, you could. Yeah. I... There are calls that could be made, friends that could be <laughs> nudged. I, the, there, there are wands in storage yes. for the Sorcerer's University, oh. if you wish I can. But but those, the, the children will have to go... <laughs> the, they will, the, if I move the wands from there and there... We'll have a whole month to acquire new wands before the city sets off. Yes. Alessandra, this is not a problem worth dealing with. <laughs> All right, sorry, Guildmaster. Um, and you Alessandra, do not apologize. These are the questions that need to be asked. However, they have solutions. Um, you see that. Um, uh, you see that uh, over your shoulder, Deniria, who is your chief arithmetician, leans over and says, "I believe actually our collection from the uh, Circle of the Crescent Moon may actually. Uh, I believe that they have some wands on resource. So if we ask them to pay a portion of their contract, perhaps at a discount in wands, I believe that might make up the difference, Alessander. Perfect, Alessander, uh, Deniria. Yes, Alessander, Deniria. You two talk. Figure that out." <laughs> Um, you hear a, a booming voice from across the hall, again, moving through someone who is leading a very, confi there's a full sphinx, a like yeah. winged lion of the man's face walking. Whoa. This is our, uh, I'm, are we putting on the Parade of Beasts? You are, of course, the Golden Scythe is putting on the Parade of, of Beasts. The sphinx walks up and says, um, hello, I understand that I've been brought here for the Parade of Beasts. I am, I am, of course, a speaking and thinking creature. <laughs> <laughs> we completely understand. Yes. We completely understand. The title Parade of Beasts is archaic in many ways. Yes. From a time <laughs> when uh, the riches of Avalir were not so that we would ha be graced by the presence of one such as yourself. Great. Oh, I, uh, um, uh, you may call me um, Pharaohmine. Great Pharaohmine. Uh, you see, he says, uh, do you. It, I was instructed that you just needed me to roar. I can say, if you want me to say something. <laughs> yes. Should anyone uh, uh, converse with you, I you should feel more than welcome to speak. However, uh, we thought it might be easier for you should you just give an enormous roar <laughs> from deep within. Uh, it's quite all right. The, the, the scythe has saved my maze and repelled a number of monsters from oh, my home, so oh, okay, I, yeah. I owe you a great, <laughs> I owe you, do you, great. are you no. unaware that? No, no, no oh, I'm sorry. very aware and and thrilled <laughs> that you're here to give back I, I, to a, 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 an order that's given so much to you. You're, you're, the, you're the sailor and marines of the Harvest Moon, your, your merchant yes, company, they course. they saved the, yes. the enchanted they glade in which my maze can be found and yes. They, so, and I said I would give, I owed them a boon, <laughs> thinking that I might, in a time of need, come to their rescue. And they said, do you, are you free on this date for the parade of, <laughs> oh well, parade of beasts? And what ease it is for you that you, you need not give of yourself in any way. We, we simply ask that you oh, uh, parade. <laughs> that's it. Yeah, I guess that's, yeah, I guess that's, I guess it's easier for me. <laughs> uh, what is your name again? Oh, uh, Pharaohmine. Pharaohmine, you need to get, uh, can you go ahead and get with uh, Alessander and then the two of you just talk and I'm gonna keep on moving. Um, you see that Alessander says, uh, how much do we owe you for the, your service? And he says, no, no, I'm, I, it's a It's a boon, it's a boon! <laughs> <laughs> Pay him, it's a boon! <laughs> Um, oh. As you walk forward, as you walk forward, as you walk forward, you see, um, you see, uh, you hear off like uh, payment and boons. Is that right? Uh, and you <laughs> see uh, the captain of your sailor marines, um, Badra Captain Badron Esperad, walk up and say. There's the guild master himself, the dragon of Avalir. Oh, Captain Badron, and I think we'll do a nice classic forearm. <laughs> yes, uh, beautiful. Pirate to pirate. Um, uh, uh, you see, he says, um, there are some friends here to help in tonight's celebration, and I promise they'd be able to meet you. Children, if you'd be so kind, uh. this is the founder of the feast and the creator of the Sorceress University. And you see there are a number of sorceress youths from all over Exandria. You see they're up in robes of gold uh, standing there. Some of them have scintillating dragon scales, some crackle with electricity. These are sorceress children. They're children that have manifested a connection innately to magic, um, and they line up in these robes and go, 
Thank you, Guildmaster Nidus Okiro, yes. for creating the Sorcerer's University so that we could study magic. Do and now do the do do and you see the, the trunk and they create a, a roaring dragon that moves uh, for tonight's fireworks extravaganza. These kids have already learned how to. Little they're like, so, it, so it, it comes forward at one point. It's an hour. Hour. Um, In ages long past, the wizards of Avalir defeated. Children, children. Uh, and I'm going to kneel down. That was spectacular. You are all going to do a fantastic job at tonight's event. Um, the little kid that you're, you're sort of the, that's nearest to you looks up and um, he looks at you and he says, "Is it true that you're a little bit of a little bit of dragon too?" Uh, <laughs> uh, I say, "Only in name, child." Uh, and then I'm gonna cast. Uh, Fun. Fireball. <laughs> uh, 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 too many spells. Too many spells. <laughs> I'm going through too much stuff and I can't find what I want. Um, I actually don't think I have anything. Uh, but I, uh, mm -hmm. I do want to just uh, breathe a little smoke out of my nose. If you'll just let me do that. Yeah, you're a dragon sorcerer. Okay, yeah, great. absolutely. I do a little, but yeah. Uh, and you see the kids go just immediately go berserk and just like, ah, uh, and they run off. Um, and you see, you hear one older kid be like, "I told you so," and they <laughs> scatter off. Um, but Dron smiles and says, "Good eggs." No pun intended. Gesturing to the dragon up, at, up above. <laughs> of course. Um, he looks at you and says, um, Ninus, I wanted to, to uh, touch base as well. The children wanted to see you. They're very excited for the fireworks extravaganza. Um, I went to go get the actual payment for the Stormbringers. They helped us on that thing on the coast of Asilra. Mm. Um, and I was told that we needed to forestall their payment by some time. Is that true? Mm -hmm. Just for, uh, uh, through uh, the replenishment. By the time we are back in the air, everything will be in order. All right. Can you start, you can hold, it's just, it's just through until we're back in the air. Uh, yeah, well, if that's the, if that's what it is, that's what it is. I mean, there, there's nothing they can do if, if they need to, if they're told to wait, they will wait. It's just that the business there's not completely resolved, so it would be nice to be able to use them again. Um, do they have to wait the entire month while we're terrestrial, or? I mean, hopefully, once um, once certain debts are paid, given uh, after this, uh, uh, upon our return, uh, certain debts will be paid, which will hopefully fill coffers, which will uh, free things up. But right now, uh, Audrin, I really, um, we need to keep this one on hold. You have the vision, Guildmaster. Tough conversations are not the thing I'm most frightened of, and uh, he uh, and he heads uh, he heads off. Um, uh, where do, where does Nidus move now? You think like this, this you know? Um, I I think uh, would Nidus know that uh, kites are coming? Yes, you would. I would move uh, to find. Uh, I would be looking for the one from my brother. Um, you go up to your office and see the kite tapping gently against the window. Hello, friend. <laughs> um, uh, it opens up. Um, you see uh, your brother Edelis, his script on a letter, his wife Irmae's uh, incredible uh, sort of nut and fruit loaf, this like ground based something like home cooking that you haven't had in so long. Oh, um, this loaf. <laughs> this beautiful <laughs> loaf. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's oh, just a sweet, it's gorgeous. <laughs> sweet little Nidus loaf. This is just holding a loaf. <laughs> um, uh, uh, you see the, uh, the it's a it's a short letter, um, and you see it says uh, uh, underneath it it says, um, even dragons have to land. There will be a table set for you when you get here, brother. Oh, it's a Hallmark card. <laughs> oh, <that's> truthy. <laughs> um, 
I think Nidus takes a moment, uh, cuts just the, the notch of the bread, uh, as it'll likely be some of the only food he gets to eat uh, today. Mm-hmm. Um, not noshes on it, um, and uh, then without fail, as you say that, you get a bite in, and there's a knock at the door. Yeah. Um, you see um, uh, that Alistair enters and says, uh, "My lord." Um, uh, Magister Milus Fren is here to speak with you. Um, mm. sh- if if you're busy, I don't have to let him in. But if if you wish. Oh no no no! Uh, with the replenishment coming up, I don't want anyone to feel ignored. Um, who is this man? Give me a history check. Who is this man? Who is no, this man? Is it on our twenty-page no. uh, lore doc? That's a cool seventeen. Seventeen. I mean, he's a magister, <laughs> but you. But truly, truly to you, this is a nobody. Got it. <laughs> um, uh, you see a reedy. Oh, can I say one more thing, yes. Alistair? Yeah. I say, um, if this doesn't seem to be that important, thirty seconds in, I need. Uh, I need a call. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Anyway, um, Alistair steps out, and you see that a reedy, kind of sallow-faced. Uh, Archmage steps in. This is a mag- member of the Magisterium. Mm-hmm. Um, and you see he comes in and says, um, Ah, Guildmaster. Magister. Uh, on such a busy day, I do yes. appreciate. I am so sorry that time has worked out that I must bother you on such a busy occasion. Oh, think nothing of it. Um, but I've heard you might be the man to come talk to. Mm. I. Uh, I've heard some rumors about some movement in some of the uh, upper echelons, and I'm looking to see if I might be able to um, be a welcome hand to those in need, uh, as I uh, owe some favors to some friends of mine uh, higher up near the arch sept, you understand. Mm. Um, And I've heard that when it comes to the replenishment uh, that, well, sometimes there's, uh, as we know, the auxiliary batteries have been lit up, and uh, it seems that there might be a surplus of ether this year. Uh, and I was wondering if uh, you were the man to come and speak to you about that. On a 17 history, mm-hmm. you don't like that this guy. This is too low. Yeah, too low for you to notice. And and too low for this guy for to have uh, to be talking this openly about something like this. Uh, Magister, (laughs) I do not know to whom you speak who felt so comfortably embracing rumor as if it were fact, but this is not the case and you have come to the wrong person. (laughs) And I would ask that you excuse me as I have much to do with regard to the replenishment. Alistair opens the door and says, Guildmaster, the the Sphinx is pitching alts on his roar. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. Uh, Oh my god. <laughs> well, uh, we really need to nail this down. Uh, you know, talent. Uh, have a lovely day, Magister. Uh, he looks and you see Alistair, uh, Captain Esperod steps in and says, Magister, right this way. Yes. Um, and moves him on out of there. Um, Alexander, what the fuck? <laughs> Is he actually doing that? Do I, oh. is, the, is the Sphinx actually pitching alts on his roar, or is that was that no, your creative no, solution? No, no, that was my creative solution. The Sphinx is actually just sort of so, sulking in a corner. Oh, right. <laughs> well, that's more of a problem. <laughs> oh, sorry, I just thought he just seemed. But do you have some ideas for alts on a roar? And that like, all, all glory to Avril. Oh, I that do. he would yell that instead of roaring. Maybe he could do both. I don't know. It's a long parade. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, honestly, Alison, I'm sorry for shooting this down. This is good. Let's go talk to that Sphinx. <laughs> you take off. We move from the golden sight. Um, uh, incredible. Um, and as we move from the golden sight, I'm going to press some buttons. Remember when we started with the scariest thing in the whole world? Yeah, yeah. And that scene like, happened. Kind of forgotten it. And now things are kind of fun. Look how happy we yeah, all are. Size of, size of a mountain. Size of a mountain. The sun without eyes. Uh-huh. <laughs> the girl was kidding. Really fast. <laughs>
but at least we laugh. <laughs> Sun was fishing in space. It's cool. <laughs> like you do. Um, Who did we betray? Um, no, no, I didn't betray no. nobody. No one. We're fine. This is great. We're doing great. We're and then the bad one happened. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, we move uh, from the Golden Scythe um, and once again begin to shift uh, back towards a neighborhood that we haven't really explored yet here within Avalier. Um, we go now past Excelsior Plaza all the way to uh, Cloudstone. Uh, we have seen so far that the Tower of the First Night, we go deeper, massive marble building, the footsteps, people <coughs> echo off of cold stone. And we see an emblem up above of a massive eye with a slitted pupil <laughs> overhead. The people who move in this place are not wearing robes, and they do not carry orbs, nor staves, nor wands, but instead weaponry. This place does not hum with magic, but instead a cold and silent somberness fills the air here. This is a place of sharp clarity. Through the echoing halls, an assortment of well, I suppose we might call them rogues, but there is not very much roguish about them. They wear rings, the emblem of an eye on the outside. And we see one such member walking down a corridor, flanked by some attendants. Guardian of the Seventh, Senior Sight Warden of the Eyes of Avalier. Travis, did you describe your character? Yeah. Uh, you see, uh, standing tall, but with a, a cloak and, and a hood pulled up just behind his, uh, his feathered head, uh, a six and a half foot tall um, uh, ice fura, so uh, a bird person, if you will, with very white feathering uh, that falls into brown tips, um, a dark beak with Slightly gray, slightly bluish eyes, proud, strong shoulders, strong wings tucked back, but but fairly folded back beneath a uh, a cloak, um, and uh, a, a badge of some sort that's just slightly hidden on his on his person. His arms sort of tucked in tight, only to, if for no other reason than to hide the double holstered axes, hand axes that are underneath his his arm, and wraps. Uh, around his his wrists and his taloned fingers and feet, um, as he as he moves along, and this is a uh, Serret, a Grupnan. Serret walks a mode of transportation that is not your primary form of movement, but here in these halls with all of these terrestrial folks, even in this skyborn city, you walk into a chamber carved of a single piece of marble. It's about 40 feet by 40 feet. The ceiling's about 30 feet tall. One wall in the marble is carved with pure force. <laughs> As you walk in, you see that there are a collection of some of them might be artifacts or magical items. Many of them are just debris and bric-a-brac. There's like a partially sort of ruined carpet. There's, and they're floating in this pure white marble room. As you walk in with your attendants, they stop at the beginning and you see a burly, leather-clad half-orc uh, with a big old tusk coming out, the other one got chopped off some time ago. Um, but you see he's got his hair kind of pulled back into a long ponytail, leather cord wrapped around. Looks back and he goes, oh, Pinch, how the hell are you? I'm good. It's good to see you, Arwen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, 
You ready for this? I mean, I don't know how much the boys are going to be able to do. You see that there's some sort of figures that are partially concealed behind that force, that sort of window of force. Uh, they go up, and you see that one of them presses a button and projects a voice using magic into the space and says, Sight Warden, uh, we're ready whenever you are, so just give us the signal and we'll activate the chamber. Always got to make them wait, understand? Do things on your own time. <laughs> um, you see Orem looks up at you and says, yeah, yeah, the, the kids, the eggheads in there, uh, yeah, I love like that. Uh, how's the missus doing, by the way? You gotta come by and have dinner sometime. I appreciate that, yeah, it's uh, uh, real busy at the house. We'll, we'll, we'll take you up on that. You seem to have gotten here before me. Anything I need to know before we begin? Well, you know, this is basically the debris, so, you know, we were parked over Vasselheim for about 10 days. Um, you know, we were there trading, last port of call before coming home, um, taking off from Asilra and flying straight here. Uh, while we were there, uh, you know, the, we get reports from the constabulary in Vasselheim that the Archmage Vespin Chloris is, hold on a second. The Archmage Vespin Chloris is, uh, gone missing. Uh, we didn't think anything of it, you know. <laughs> The, the report of the, t basically, the only reason we heard either tale of it is that the uh, the people there were worried that he was doing some heresy. You know Vasselheim, they're worried that someone was doing something against the gods. And, uh, so, what we did then is, you know, they say, hey, did this guy do anything and is he, is he stowing away aboard the city and about to take off? So we did a sweep, we said no. Vespa Chloris is not stowed away. But, you know, even if he was, we're not going to answer to a, you're not going to extradite the guy, so. Uh, no trace of him, just vanished into thin air. Well, that's what we've been getting the chamber ready for. I mean, they, you know, we took a quick look at his chambers, no hiding or hair of him. I mean, the rumor is he was trying to recreate the matron's Ritual. <laughs> Another one of those, huh? Yeah, exactly. I mean, every two bit sorcerer edge maze pops up with their body scattered in a miasma of their own goo trying to name check some prime deity. It comes in here, nothing more than a stain, but, uh, you know, this, uh, it looks like this Joker did it so bad that he didn't even leave a hair or a fingernail. I mean, there's nothing left of the guy. I mean, I, I appreciate you having me in here, but um, this seems like something you would be able to dismiss on your own. What, what makes this any different than the others? Well, we did dismiss it, and then they wanted to get rid of a bunch of this, which is what opens this can of worms up. So, uh, you see, he looks over and says, this bric-a-brac, all this magical nonsense from his chambers, his sanctum, this made it aboard Avalir, and it was headed for the Arcane Furnace. It was going to get uh, disenchanted, broken down, and added to the uh, the etheric net. It was, you know, so we can come back and dump all the ether into the ground and replenish the continent of Dominus. Uh, but you know, we grabbed it out of the line because uh, you know we got word from I think s someone came down. Hey. Costello, where did we get that? And you see, he looks over, uh, and you see, he says, says like, uh, says, uh, member of the Ring of Silver came down and told us we needed to pull it. Ring of Silver, you say? Yeah. So he said it was of academic importance, something like that. Mm-hmm. I might know where that might have come from. You know what, you did the right thing in involving the uh, rats in this city. Let's, um, let's see what we have, shall we? All right, boys, light her up. And you see, um, <laughs> the psychometric chamber in the center of the Hall of Eyes alights and rendered in perfect detail, not using illusion, which you would detect, but using pure transmutation, recreates from stone 
the sanctum of Vespin Chloris. What? A different movie than the rest of us. <laughs> <laughs> and, and as this happens, as he's done dozens of times before, you see his arms fall to his side, his irises open wide, and all the feathers on the back and top of his head stand up tall, full crest. Um, as you begin to do your thing, Orem keeps talking, knowing that this is such second nature to you that you can split your focus easily. Um, he looks out and says, yeah, well, you know, we had this squad teleport back when we were over the ocean, and they got back. He's still not back there, so uh, Porter's Guild's not happy that we're holding on to this stuff with the whole Great Registry and everything, and the fact that there's no Guildmaster for them right now, that the election's been postponed, so. You know, um, go ahead and give me your investigation check. Ooh, yeah. A roll, yes. a roll. He's, mo he's just moving <laughs> slowly around the room as this uh, as this happens. Holy shit! Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, hmm, hmm. Thirty-one. Oh, oh level, 13. level fourteen. Level fourteen. There it is. For those at home, uh, in the in the general breakdown of difficulty classes of DCs, thirty is the top success level that they list. They don't list any higher <laughs> than 30. Um, you're looking around. So the chamber shifts, <laughs> stone grows, shifts, and you are looking at the sanctum, and um, as you are looking at it, uh, a series of controls opens up around you. Um, uh, you see these little glyphs. You know that one of them you can shift to move the sanctum backwards through time. The way this magic works is it is the memory of the objects in the space. So you have a recording of what the objects remember. Unfortunately, the way the psychometric chamber works is it do, these objects don't record the passage of beings. They don't record like organic creatures. They just record other inanimate objects. So, but you can move through time. You can move through day and night. You can see different states that the sanctum was in. And another one allows you to actually like zoom in. You almost never need to use that one. Um, uh, that's for people that are not. Um, as you look in, you see Orum goes. So, you know, I mean, we're holding on to this stuff for academic concern. I mean, what do you think? You think the guy actually did the damn thing? We, I, f I feel like I read in my history books that when the Matron of Ravens ascended, it was pretty clear there was a new god of death. I mean, people knew about it. I, I think we would have heard as a new god of jerking off or whatever this guy is. <laughs> <laughs> we know. Um, your attention is drawn to this sanctum is windowless. Um, it is uh, cold and austere. There are some candelabras. There are a lot of writings here in some of the objects, glyphs that you recognize as celestial, some you recognize as infernal. You see something on the floor it uh, it's badly rusted or corroded. It's like an old piece of metal. It's maybe about a foot and a half long. It's got like this patina of corrosion on it, but your eye moves to it. Um, and as you examine it, you realize that this is something disenchanted, and it used to be much larger. On a 31, um, you see a little glyph hover in the air next to you um, with a library fr from the, li the symbol of the librarium in Cantatum opens up, and you see the ability to move through like all recorded artifacts, magical items, everything Avalier's ever come into contact with, like appears before you. But you're looking at this thing, and you feel like looking at the corrosion on it, it used to be much bigger. This is a fragment left of something that wasn't just like broken or shattered, it was like almost rusted away instantaneously. 
Is the shape familiar with anything I've held before? Is it a fragment or a piece, or does it look whole? Thinking of it as a fragment, you recognize the curvature of the end of it starts to curl back, and you think you're looking at a part of a bow. And as you think of that, you see that Orum comes over and says, what do you got there? What are you looking at, Pinch? Well, uh, unless my years haven't served me well, I think we're dealing with a piece of a weapon. As you do that, you see that the glyph next to you zeroes in, and you begin to look. Um, as you begin to like hold it in your hand, this like dull, inert, non-magical metal, you look really closely and see that the corrosion comes from a disenchantment. Now, this is where your impossible investigation skills and also your proficiency with arcana and magical workings, most of the disenchantments you come across work in a spell casting way in which the thing that was being disenchanted was targeted. As a result, when something corrodes or is disenchanted, it tends to have a pattern in the patina that is left on it that starts at a center and moves outward, right? That like a wizard in a dispelling check will name something and break it. Now, already to disenchant a magical item, we're talking about ninth level magic. You're talking about really, re really rare stuff, even in the Age of Arcana. This doesn't have that pattern to it. You're looking almost at like the, how you, forensically, how you would look at something and say, okay, if this, if this was targeted to be disenchanted, it would start at a center point and move out. Everything here has the same grain to it, which means that some energy came into a space and exploded or moved outwards and was able to indiscriminately disenchant a magical object. Along with everything else. As you look on that 31, you look and see marks on the ground of a summoning circle that has been completely eradicated. That something was supposed to be bound here. And the thing that was supposed to be bound so wildly and easily escaped those bounds that it erased any obvious trace of a summoning circle. You don't even think the other guys that have come in here already, you don't think Orin can see it, you don't think anyone else can see it, but you're looking and see traces. There's no recollection of what the runes even would have been, but you just see from the spacing. You're like, yep, that's a 16-point circle, that's the corners, it's oriented with the largest rune being due north. This is a summoning circle that's been erased. Or when I'm, uh, I'm betting balls to bone, this is not your standard fare. No. Yes. Well, so some kind of this guy tried to s call something up and got the better of him. I mean, they they said he was working on, uh, you know, what they're all working on. He said he was trying to crack godhood. Right. How many other people besides you and I are? Uh, privy to the details of this room. You working with anybody else, sharing information? Anybody sponsoring this for you? Well, the boys know that we're doing it, but this is the first time they've turned it on, so no one else has seen this. I'm gonna need you to go ahead and lock this down for the next hour or so. I want a full detailed record of everything in this room. I want a catalog and I want it sent to my office, just you and me. Uh. Give me, are you trying to keep this, like, how much are you keying Orum in into how concerned you are? Do you want him to be, like, keyed into this, or are you trying to keep a little bit of a veneer up? I'm keeping a little bit of a veneer, but I also don't want him to be careless. Yeah, give me a, give me a little deception check, just to, just to keep, like. Was it a secret? Keep it secrets. 15. Orum goes, you got it. We'll, uh, we'll get a record of it. We'll send it over and we'll scrub the copies on our end. It'll just be sitting on your desk. I would appreciate that. Um, he points to the thing in your hand and says, do you want us to enter that into evidence or? No, let me, uh, let me run this by a couple, of, a couple of friends I have. You hold on to it. Um, you look back at the circle 
totally gone. There's no telling what the runes could have been. There's nothing left. You've seen a lot of people who attempted something stupid, and there's almost always a testament. Something left about a, a body, a mistake. It's so empty. You walk away. But I'll tell you where it's not empty! Ah! Uh, <laughs> um, um, uh, we transition uh, from this place uh, to the heights, and I think we all know exactly where we're going. <laughs> uh, we're going to the very top, the summit of Avalier. And as we arrive, uh, we see the Arch Sept, home of the Septarian, the seven highest Archmages of Avalier. In the grand chamber, the central dome at the base of the Arch Sept, where outside the great staircase leads up to the halls of the Septarian, the eldest and most powerful wizards of Avalier, we see a 100 foot tall statue, a colossus, of a beautiful elven man carved in marble, his long hair behind him, Emir the Bold. He stands, reaching up to the very heights of the dome itself, looking down at his outstretched hand, circling above his hand, levitating some 20 feet above it, is the city of Avalir in miniature. Miniature, of course, it still being some 20 feet wide and 20 feet tall. At the base of the statue of this ancient and powerful elven wizard, Emir the Bold, whose great magic lifted the city of Avalir from its terrestrial constraints, forever sundering Toramunda into its component cities of Avalir and Kathmoira. Emir Porco, great wizard and first of the Septarian. At the feet of Emir Porco, who do we find, Marisha? <laughs> you see a middle aged, although you wouldn't be able to tell, <laughs> elven woman. Clear ivory skin with hair that is silvery white. Almost reflects the sky around her. She has a long kind of collared, breasted coat over top that stretches down like a, a gown in an emerald green that almost has its own silken sheen to it with a kind of teal blue indigo, <laughs> name your color dress, depending on how it hits the light mm -hmm. underneath. In her hair, she has this, almost like a sun ray fascinator made of gold, where pieces of her hair are falling through it. And around her neck is a rigid golden ring. If you look closely at it, it has tiny blue crystals, almost like tiny Swarovskis that are broomstone. Ooh. And it lightly levitates oh, and go. rotates and spins around her at all time. Mm as well as a orb, a glowing orb, that is her focus, that also just kind of hovers, almost celestial, planetary in nature. She looks as if the outfit was made for her this morning, because it probably was. <laughs> <laughs> her makeup is impeccable. She is the most put together woman you have ever seen in your life. And she looks up and she just goes, Happy replenishing, Grandfather. The massive statue of your grandfather smiles knowingly, his gaze eternally fixed upon the city that he raised into the sky. The very top of the staircase, spiraling around the dome, 
A wall seamless changes and swirls with magic energy as a door appears. Pesha, you're here to meet Loris of the Weaver's Mask, a member of the Ring of Gold. Those 14 wizards, apprentices of the Septarian, who command respect second only to the seven archmages that rule the city itself. Loris of the Weaver's Mask commands respect and status by virtue of being an apprentice to one of these archmages. And you've come here to meet him on the Day of the Replenishing here in the Arch Sept. One of the few people who even is allowed to walk within this place. This is a magocratic society. This is not open to the public, but you are not the public. As Keeper of Scrolls, you find yourself welcome here. But of course, not every Keeper of the Scrolls has been, no. That position has an extra meaning in subtle and clever hands. The door opens, Loris steps out, and is accompanied by a second figure. And I'm going to need to know your reaction when you see the gleaming visage of Eldamir the Wise, one of the seven of the Septarian, one of the true seven, steps out and begins to descend the staircase. She has all of the cool. She does not show it on her face. In the back of her head, uh, there's a little twinge of her wondering, what is he doing here? Uh, but she would never show it on her face except for maybe the ever slight tilt of an eyebrow. Mm. Um, Loris, uh, the apprentice who walks here, Loris of the Weaver's Mask is a beautiful, raven-haired elven man who wears a partial mask over his face. Um, his cloak is of red and green and gold and purple, uh, carved many bright colors, uh, and as his hands move through space, you can almost always see strings trailing from them, fading translucently into magic. The arcane power commanded by Loris is uh, overshadowed by almost no one, with the exception of Eldamir the Wise. Uh, Eldamir has sat on the council since the beginning of Avalir. Uh, it is rare to see an ancient elf, but you see, slightly bowed with age, wearing a shimmering golden cloak that appears to offer a little glimmering crystals of golden light that shimmer in geometric shapes and turn into motes and float away, a face illuminated by its own wisdom and counsel. The eyes of Eldamir are soft and smiling, and he leans upon a wooden staff that he has wielded for centuries. Your eminence. Keeper. It is a pleasure to meet you here in this place. The pleasure is mine. What do I owe the pleasure? Um, you see, Loris says, the great Archmage Eldamir the Wise wished to meet you face to face, my good friend. <laughs> you see, um, uh, Eldamir says, I did, I did wish to meet you face to face. I was told, the word reached my ear, high up though I am, I still see much, that the record has been set that the Librarium in Cantatum, under its current Keeper of Scrolls, has bested the previous record for magical knowledge gained in a single venture. And I asked to whom the young Archmage Porco had wrested this title, and I was informed she had wrested it from herself, <laughs> who had set the previous record. Oh, 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 oh. Oh, my God. 
Well, <laughs> <no doubt. laughs> it is quite an honor to hear that my exploits have reached your ears. Yes, well, of course. I, I, I wished only to see you. How, how do you? Oh, <laughs> I didn't think of where we would meet your grandfather in the end. <laughs> yes. Hey, when I was a young lad, I saw him and thought, there is wizardry itself. Uh, the, the sheer brilliance, the, the sight, the vision. To go to the, the druids of old Toramunda, those old Gaudrashari, and to say to them, well, you listen here, you. Uh, you might be able to turn into a bear, but so what? I was going to take the city to the sky. <laughs> and, to, and, he, and, to, and he wrestled with them, he did, and they said, you're not going to split the city in half, and he said, there's more broomstone. Did you know that the veins of broomstone set into the sculpture are perfect to the millimeter with the veins of broomstone in the base of the city itself. It is a perfect replica. You know, I did, but I never tire of hearing of it or your stories. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that I repeat myself. That, oh, here's a story you won't have heard, and I'll tell this, and it's a little... It's a little it's How pleased I have all the time. Well, they... Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> Are you all right? Do you need to sit down? Are you all right? No, 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 quite all right. Hold on. I... <coughs> there it is. Oh, oh well. <laughs> all I wished to say was, oh, your <laughs> grandfather and me, poor Curly, me the bull, they made this statue, and the original, the original artist, the original artist, he was going to be lifting the city aloft, and the, in the, the structure that he made, they had a small miniature version. This was, this was centuries ago. Yes. And they had a small miniature version, and they lifted it up, and they said, well, put it in the dome. And he said, so what? Everyone standing on the floor is going to see the bottom of my chin looking up at the city up here. It's the most unflattering angle <laughs> I, I've ever heard of. He said, the city should be down here. So the people on the ground can see my face looking down at this idiot. <laughs> <laughs> After all, it's all perspective. Perspective is exactly the word. Um, Loris, you would be so kind as to speak to um, the Keeper of Scrolls. Uh, there are some matters of perspective, and I'm very interested to know what on this, the eve of the replenishment, what you see is the future of Avalie. Ha, ha, ha. How does the day strike you, my lady? Oh, goodness, that is quite the question, but I believe deeply in me and my fellow compatriots and our dreams of Avalier and continuing to set the reputation of the forefront of the Age of Arcanum. We will always be first and foremost. That is my goal and destiny. Destiny? Yes. A single golden tear collects at the corner of his eye, says, we live in an age where we now know that we may write our own destiny. Loris, talk, talk to her about what we, you know, talk to her. And you see, he says, happy replenishing to you, keeper of scrolls. Your eminence. He vanishes from this place. Loris turns to you. Sorry for the surprise. I'm never surprised. It's this uncanny resolve you possess that means that we have some conversations to hold. My counterpart, the other apprentice of Eldamir the Wise, Volusia of the Heart's Emblem. Volusia? Uh, you see, he leans in and says, Volusia. Uh, Volusia has announced her intention to retire. 
and an apprentice's seat will be opening in the Ring of Gold. In the Ring of Gold? That is correct. She has announced her intention to return to Kale Moro in Marquette, there to... I couldn't tell you. Why would she want to go to Marquette? She has grown weary of the sky, she says, and wishes for the company of other elves. She, I don't know, wants to build a tower. Perhaps she's tired of being a medium fish. Hmm. Well, I'm not sure what good it is to be a larger fish in a puddle. <laughs> That's because I'm talking to a shark. <laughs> yes. I'm mentioning this to you, and I'll let your imagination do the rest, but there are concerns that Eldemir the Wise has, and they are very real concerns. The amelioration of these concerns would be of the utmost comfort to my mentor and master. We, uh, we have word that Aeor may be preparing an attack on Lathras. Uh, you would know Lathras is one of the smaller flying cities. Um, you know, they're drumming up the usual something or other about war. Our understanding at the moment is that it's to test something. There's no actual threat that Lathras poses. It's a, it's a dry run of something that they might intend to use elsewhere. The time has come for us to make good on the scurrying that I know this, uh, what do you all call it? The Ring of Brass? Yes. Uh, you see, <laughs> <laughs> if you have something up your sleeve, Pesha, now might be the time. Uh, oh, two other small things. I know you have a busy day, and uh, this will be the last time we're able to speak. No, this uh, is clearly of the utmost importance. Um, obviously, that is incredibly private. You share that only at your utmost discretion. It will join the other secrets up my sleeve. Very well. Then I look forward to what you may accomplish in the days to come. Uh, two other minor things. Um, we've had to uh, shut down the Hall of Prophecy, so I'm not sure if the Guildmaster Nidus had anything planned there, but uh, the Hall of Prophecy is uh, this is just a little... Um, Why? Uh, the oracles require rest. There are some issues with the return to Dominus. I believe that they may have just been exhausted. Um, it's been some tremendous output from there recently. And they couldn't take a rest in one day's time? It's possible that they will be able to reopen following tomorrow's great replenishment. Perhaps during the festival of the replenishment, while we are terrestrial, we may be able to reopen it, but I will let you know as soon as we have some more information. I certainly hope so. Uh, also, uh, it has come to the attention of Eldemir the Wise that some artifacts from Vasselheim may have made their way aboard the city. Hmm. Uh, there is a site warden, I believe Guardian of the Seventh, um, the site warden, you see he pulls something up, in his own spell book. The site warden Agrupnin. I believe this is someone with whom you have some fair share of business. Site warden. Yes. Oh, yep, yeah, oh, right, yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yes. Um, <laughs> uh, you see, he says, um, uh, it's come to the attention of Eldemir the Wise that there may have been some attempts by this Archmage Chloris to recreate some uh, you know, vestigial, an attempt to uh, recreate the matron's ritual. Um, the first time ever 
Pesha shows a little bit of her inner thoughts and just gives like the slightest hint of an eye roll. <laughs> Does divinity and the ascension thereupon cause you some disdain, Keeper? <laughs> it just feels like such a hollow title, especially compared to the wonders and the powers that we possess as mere mortals. You see underneath the towering statue of your grandfather, himself immortal, your words ring throughout the dome. Loris raises an eyebrow and says, I admire your, uh, for lack of a better term, team spirit. <laughs> Eldamir the Wise is concerned with the wielding of such dangerous magics, and if you are able to collect any reports from the Guardian of the Seventh, it has been voiced by the Archmage Eldamir that those transmissions not be referred to the normal chain of command. Uh, the Magisterium does not need to be alerted as to the Site Warden's findings. If you might do the Archmage the favor of reporting those findings directly to me, that would be highly beneficial. Directly to you. Well, I shall speak to the Octothurge, run it up the chain, as they say. You see, he says, um, of course, these findings should be released to the Octothurge immediately. Well, uh, I would just, I can see your reticence. But for me, my concern is how this information even fell into the hands of this one, Mage Chloris. Well, those questions deserve answers. Absolutely terrestrial mages coming into power. Obviously, the odds that he was in any way, shape, or form successful are slim. But it's dangerous magic to tangle with, and it's the responsibility of this council to see that Exandria is kept safe from any such meddling. Uh, a formal report should, of course, be made to the Octothurge, but I understand that those take some time to compile. So if informally you wished to communicate any findings of the site wardens directly to me, it would be greatly appreciated. You have my word. We will be in touch. Archmage Porco nods and leaves. From there, uh, the day moves on, and we, uh, uh, I believe uh, uh, we take some time to, uh, uh, wait, how much time, do, uh, sorry, Kyle, how much time do we have? <laughs> Should we stop? Should we keep going? Uh, uh, no one is answering. No, <laughs> no, no one's, one's answering. You want to take uh, a break? Take well, a break. Uh, you control the rain. Hey, there's two, two hours, hours and three, great time great. for a break. Uh, hey, uh, hey, I'm running the show here. Yeah. It's break yeah. time. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> tune in after the break as we continue this. Exandria Unlimited, Calamity. Yeah! Hey Critters, Laura Bailey here to guide you through what's new in the Critical Role Shop. Could anything be more perfect? Look at this, isn't it fashion? So much fashion happening here. I mean, the Traveler always says impulse purchases are a good decision. Style should never be a dumb start, darling. Roll an investigation if you want. It's basically perfect. And hey, if you want, you could head over to the Critical Role shop right now. Thank you. 
doing this right or oh sorry um am i doing this right you can also gift subscriptions to fellow critters so what are you waiting for start spreading that sweet serenity with a twitch subscription to critical role it's like a warm blanket oh, oh hold on it's my proctologist just give me a second okay hello 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 Oh, hey, hey, Doc, yeah, what, what's up? What do you mean, more teeth? I thought you got rid of them all. Well, no, you don't tell me to relax. I'm the one with teeth up my... Subscribe.
Sam just said taint. Hi, folks, and welcome back to Exandria Unlimited Calamity. I am your GM, Brennan Lee Mulligan. We rejoin those members of the. You did, and you did. It's funny because it's true. Um, <laughs> The important thing is this, we return to Exandria in an age long past in the flying city of Avalir. I would describe the place that we return to in Avalir, um, but it might be rude of me because it doesn't belong to me. Uh, so I might ask for someone else at the table to describe it, but I will say this. The day has passed and many of your responsibilities have taken you abroad. This is the last day before the city of Avalir will land and make good on its ancient pacts by releasing its store of ether, of raw magical energy, back into the lands of Dominus to replenish that continent and make good the promise to the druids of old Toramunda that a new age will come, an age of flourishing, of magic. In the year following a replenishment, crops explode throughout the land, and often a generation of magical children will be born, and there will be a revitalizing. The Fae will flourish, and doors to lands of wonder and plenty and magic will open. Uh, the replenishment is such an important time for the many cultures of Dominus. And for many days now, that continent, you've seen fireworks going up. As you approach Kath Moira, you see all the villages and towns surrounding it send up fireworks, kites flying. As you approach Kath Moira, you begin to hear it. You are now close enough as the sun lowers off the western edge of the city, the choirs of Kath Moira singing. Far off, but even here above the clouds, you hear the distant but palpable songs of welcoming, a return home, a month of rest and repair on arcane infrastructure and all manner of civic defenses and technology, but also a return home in a spiritual way, in an emotional way, a return to the earth the release of magical energy and a reuniting of the mountain that once was, a very historically significant mountain. As the sun sets, shadows grow long. Uh, as the sun sets, uh, shadows grow long and you find yourselves hearing festivities and the parade of beasts begins and you can hear revelry all throughout the city. It's Kind of wild to throw a party the night before a month of parties, but what the hell? Let's get it started. <laughs> this is the last party before you have to party with all the people from the ground. So let's party now, Wizards of Avalir. <coughs> and Normies. <coughs> exactly. Yeah. And Normies. And Normies. Are there Normies here? Um. <laughs> yeah. um Speaking of parties, we uh, look over the vast city, uh, the roaring cheers of taverns in these harbor side neighborhoods. We see harbors on the east and west shelves of Avalir with docked sky ships with their broomstone on either side of the ship's decks. We see going up Excelsior Plaza just a wash and multicolored light as everyone gathers there to cheer in the replenishment. People will be partying here all night. They will party until dawn uh, to welcome the replenishment. The scythe has libations flowing freely until the dawn. And then uh, Caro hulks with cots and beds at the ready will ferry people home to sleep it off. Uh, You're welcome. <laughs> You're all so welcome. Wow. Uh, however, uh, there are some uh, parties that are not only just for festivities, but for the well-to-do to see each other, and perhaps the most prestigious of these pre-replenishment galas now unfolds at the Palazzo Porco. Oh. Uh, Marisha, your ancestral home, mm. a, a palace for wizards. Um, can, feel free to describe, if you would be so kind, the uh, the visage of this place that we now see before us, and perhaps any preparations that Pesha has made in advance of this once every seven years must attend gala. Yes, what nobody saw was moments before guests arrive. Portia was 
uh, clamping and clopping around. Pesha, uh, <laughs> sorry, that's my She's character. Sweating this gal. Yes. <laughs> I forgot yes. my own name for it. Jeez. Oh goodness, <coughs> Pesha. <laughs> <laughs> Who am I? Who are any? Stressful. Who are any of us? Planning a party. <laughs> Hard. <laughs> She's kind of uh, prancing around the foyer, and she is barking at her servants, and she turns to Melindra and is like, Melindra, are all the gift baskets ready for everyone from the Septarium who may be arriving? Oh, for, oh from uh, the Sept. Well, yes. um, my lady, we are not expecting any, uh, any from the Septarian. No one responded. Well, many, many from the Ring of Gold uh, will be in attendance. The apprentices of the Septarian okay. will, will, will yes. likely be here. But, uh, but the, <clears throat> I believe the Septarian are. Um, sorry, I have extra gift baskets, and um, and all of them have the two hundred wands that we were expecting from Nidus, correct? Yes, those wands actually did arrive. Um, some of them had to be uh, cleaned because there was some juice. I think some children may have gotten their hands on some of them. They weren't new wands. No, no, no. They were what? They were brand new. I believe some um, sorceress youths may have. Um, uh, I'll speak to Nidus. And the guild masters are all arriving, and all of their packages um, have arrived as well. The entire Octothurge will be in attendance. Um, those those most significant chairs of the Magisterium, um, the Court of Workings, of course, will be in attendance, attendance as well as the Court of Owls. Um, the guild masters, <coughs> the hierophants of the of the um, eight guilds. Mm. Um, they are all coming. Do we? Uh, many of them have asked for some extra guests in the previous hour. Do we want? <gasps> Plus ones. Moments before a party starts. Just um. Yes. A anyone. Anyone can come. It is the replenishing. Uh, very well. I will see to that uh, right away. And <clears throat> um, oh, we we do have actually a guest um, that was re requested by one of the uh, the managers. There's a. Um, I'm so sorry. There's a, a young man f uh, who boarded uh, in Vasselheim mm -hmm. um, who uh, uh, wished to come. That was requested um, by uh, actually a member of the Ring of Silver. Um, I believe he is a, a champion of the divine. Mm. Champion of the divine. And who is his steward from the Ring of Silver? Uh, oh, um, uh, Magister Hollow. Hollow. Yes. Good, if he creates any commotion or treason, we know who is responsible. Of course, I think, I, I don't think he, he'll get <coughs> much of a fuss. He's sort of a nobody, I think. I, I think it's sort of here as a sort of party quirk. Never uh, trust a nobody, Melindra. You are so right. All right, um, <laughs> please go just to make sure that the hors d'oeuvres and the beverages are all settled and... Oh, he's, uh, he's bringing a wolf. Is that what? bad? <laughs> he's bringing a wolf. I was told he was bringing a wolf. There's just going to be a wolf. Fantastic. Uh, a wolf, and a wolf is a terrestrial creature. It's a, um, can, it's can a dog, wolf basically. Speak? Like, it's... can the wolf speak? You know, like, like the sphinxes that you see in the Parade of Beasts? <laughs> oh, the sphinx. I actually quite enjoy that sphinx. <laughs> Sorry, too forward. I <laughs> I will see if the wolf can speak. I believe I I will see if the wolf can speak. Fantastic. I guess we'll all be finding out soon, won't we? <clears throat> and she turns around in her foyer and she kind of starts sauntering her way to the grand double doors in the front. And this is it's one of those things where it's like Yes, it's her family home, but it kind of more belongs to the majocracy at this point. She doesn't really stay there. It's like mm. um, it's like the Hearst Castle, and uh, <laughs> in that way, mm. and uh, but it is made of the same kind of white, cream-colored marble that the rest of this district is carved in, and it kind of has this smooth transition with giant crystalline windows in the front that almost have like an iridescent quality to them, and ever so often the image shifts and portrays like a different stained glass relief in front of them. Amazing. And then when you walk in, there's kind of these like levitating gardens kind of yes. up in the corner, giving us these like, Fresh air, it smells like a rainforest directly after uh, a storm. 
and little tricklings of water pouring off of the side of these levitating gardens kind of vanishing to nowhere. And along the lines kind of carved in this rich marble that you see everywhere are kind of almost like golden and, and sacred geometric inlays that ever so often flash with like an arcane energy mm. that pours across it that you can see is like this entire house is just essentially wired with arcane ability. Uh, incredible. <laughs> um, illusory trumpets blare, announcing the arrival of the first guests, uh, and you see that they begin to arrive. Uh, as the sun sets, it is now fully, if you look to the east, you can see like the first stars, but if you look to the west, the sun has moved behind the continent of Dominus, but you still see like pink and rosy golden light clinging to the edge of the sky. Uh, the floating gardens are now filled with revelers. Um, the Wizards of Abelir, the majocratic government that is here and assembled, uh, as well as various other potentates and important figures, uh, begin to usher into the Palazzo Porco. And as they do, uh, illusory voices ring out announcing them. Member of the Octothirds and Dean of the College of Necromancy, Magister Hollow moves out. Uh, names, one after the other, ring out. Um, as you all arrive, do all of you, uh, uh, does anyone uh, care to describe their entrance into the party? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, man. Wow. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I will, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, Sarah obviously likes to fly in. He, he likes to just do a couple circles around the gala just to see who's taking their time, who's talking to who, clock, uh, <laughs> clock what's happening, oh, yeah. um, and then land uh, far from the entrance before he tucks his wing back in. And, uh, and actually, he doesn't enter right away. He kind of throws his hood up, and he is a six-foot-tall uh, uh, ice fura, but he still stands back a little bit and just clocks who's going in, who's talking to who, who's arm in arm. Mm -hmm. uh, together. Did I notice Sarah coming in? Uh, you know how Sarah ent uh, enters. enters. Uh, Sarah does not like his name announced <laughs> right. uh, and broadcast as he enters. I just kind of peek a corner of my eye up at him, but not even really looking at him, just enough to where I <coughs> signal that I'm aware of his entrance. Return the signal, not. <laughs> 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 Um, incredible. Sarah gets there early. The place is still filling up with revelers. You begin to hear beautiful music playing again uh, from you know groups of bards that have come here to play music, uh, singing ancient songs of the creation of Avalir. And this is, after all, the Feast of Amir. This is dedicated to the memory of Pesha's grandfather, uh, the mage. There were seven archmages of original Avalir, but this is the mage who finished the spell to enchant the broomstone and lift the city into the sky. Um, uh, who else arrives? Uh, I, before I arrive, uh, one of my, um, the, the, the the Herald's Tome, my yes. newspaper, is delivered throughout the city um, with, inside these uh, magical pneumatic tubes. There's no tubes. Mm -hmm. They just sort of free free shoot, free float <laughs> around the city. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Get down! Extra <laughs> um, <laughs> but, uh, but one of these pneumatic tubes uh, enters before me and uh, is delivered magically into the hand of the person, the caller, who's announcing uh, folks. My entrance begins far, far, uh, de deep into the courtyard outside. Mm -hmm. I'm dropped off, not at the front door, but far away from it, so I can uh, walk slowly towards the front door, trying to avoid attention as much as I can, but uh, secretly wanting it. Uh, <laughs> and uh, complaining that I was dropped off so far away <laughs> that I have to now endure the paparazzi. And People looking around, you do see that there are like clusters of wizards who are like still in the air, sort of area of like public, where it's like on the street, like, there he is, it's like Major Seely! Yes, I don't have much time, I really don't. I must go inside. I have to tell you, I've been reading the tome oh, for 20 years. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, 
you're, you're I incredible. appreciate it. Yeah. Make sure to renew the subscription next month and I'll keep walking. <laughs> I love your work. And you, <laughs> um, you dart in. Um, Loquacious Seely, Herald of Avalia, voice of the council and scribe of crowns. Uh, pff, uh, you see, uh, people actually turn and uh, give it a, a genuine round of, some people get like a golf clap, there's a, a true hooray oh, as true. you enter oh, in. No, no, really, it's too much, it's too much. Um, uh, you enter in, and I think probably, Patient, you recognize that Loquacious is going to be mobbed in the entrance hall until he is rescued. Like, ev everybody <laughs> here, uh, you see you know, someone come up and say like, eh, Mr. Seeley, it's <laughs> such a pleasure um, uh, to meet you, uh, uh, if I can. My name is Madara Glyph. I'm the oh. valedictine abjurer of the Hall of Symbols. Oh, I, I, I think we must have some mutual friends. I work with <laughs> yes. your, I work with the, uh, the architect, Ark, uh, though oh. not in her capacity as member oh. of the court working, she actually is doubly employed it's in the abjuration guild. I was wondering if I might impress upon I you to. Interrupt. I, <laughs> let it, I let it happen long enough that he he does start getting annoyed, and then I <laughs> I around. walk up and I say, oh, "Excuse me, please, allow our guests some breathing room." Patia, lovely to see you. Thank you for having us. The place looks amazing as always. Of course. Follow Where are we me. sitting? Where is everybody? Come on, we got a table in the back. Come with a plus one. Uh, let's say yes. Oh. oh let's no. say yes. What? Who did you bring? Uh, I brought. Uh, it mm -hmm. takes me a second to remember her name. I love it. Okay. Um, but uh, wow. but her wow. her name is is Bolo, I think. Bolo. Bolo. Um, <laughs> she's uh, she's a friend of a friend. We were sort of set up. This is the second uh, time I've ever met her. She's gorgeous, isn't she? Melinda, Melinda mentioned that people were asking for plus ones at the last. Oh minute. yes, I I, yes. I told everyone that that would be fine. So. All right, fantastic. Nice um, to meet you, I'm Bolo. <laughs> <laughs> no, dude, no! Come on, yes. man! Bolo. <laughs> How many Bolo? Has? Bolo wants to be a reporter like me. No. Uh, eventually, I'm going to be a reporter. No! no. no. I have no. taken her under my wing, and I think she's got a bright future. This is disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm like, whoop! Oh. 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 This your house? <laughs> yes. Um. Yeah. Yes. Who's like Bolo yes. in the city? <laughs> you know what? You know what? Bolo? Why don't you go fetch us some drinks and some? Just do some mingling. You know, there's a lot of stuff that you can hear by um, picking up on people's <laughs> conversations in these events. You might get some leads and clues. So start practicing. Maybe take some mental notes and get us some drinks. All right? In Aor, sometimes it is illegal to ask these questions. From Aor. You know, it's fascinating. I heard that there was um, some stowaways from the last time we visited Aeor. Oh, she's not a stowaway at all. I, I, I sent a letter and had her brought here, so. Yes. <laughs> no, <laughs> sorry, Do I just. You want just... drinks? <clears throat> yes, please. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> She walks off. Oh is it she she like, like, <laughs> oh, it's it's kill visual. everybody. <laughs> you kill us all. I think her name is Bolo. <laughs> I think her name is Bolo. <laughs> That's the anyway. most famous dude thing in the world. <laughs> I've I brought the most random I, like, I think Bolo means hello in Aorian uh -huh. or something. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I think her name's Bolo. <laughs> Oh, oh, God. Like, oh. She's really just saying, how are you, <laughs> every time. Anyway, where are our friends? Where, where's the circle? Oh, Ceres is making his usual rounds, mm -hmm. and I believe we're still waiting for the others. Nidus will roll up at this point. <laughs> yeah. uh, an army of, let's say, 700 Hadmigad? Hadmi uh, 700 Hadmigads are uh, carrying a full-size tree. Uh, where's the rarest place in the world uh, I, I could acquire a tree from? Oh, wow. so sick. Um, okay, at this time, Marquette like is not yet 
desert. So there, the rarest magical tree you can find is in the thick jungles of Marquette, many days journey past the nearest village, deep into the wilderness. Uh, so we got one of those. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, you see a scintillating tree. So hundreds of brightly colored arcane scarecrow automata um, carrying a tree whose bark is scint twinkling lapis lazuli and whose leaves are a deep, like You're almost right. black purple um, that continuously blooms into enormous, bright, the lightest pink blossoms all over the tree. Um, a bunch of Hamadas come in, uh, go up right to Melindra and be like, hello, milady. Where would you like one magic tree courtesy of the golden scythe? Um, I join, I, I walk up. Uh, <laughs> I like the, the hot me dots. The hot <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, no, go ahead, guys. No, I, uh... <laughs> uh, I think there are also, there's 700, so a bunch of the Hamadas are just like, hors d'oeuvres, <laughs> just like stuff. Uh, I go up to Nidus. Yes. A gift uh, to the family, Porco, uh, both to you and to your grandfather's continued vision. Nidus, you always bring the best treasures. Uh, well, uh, for the best people, <laughs> nothing else will do. And then I just kind of start to loop my hands around and you see arcane sigils form into a disc that extend out and I lift the tree kind of up and make it like this centerpiece of the party that's kind of levitating over everyone's head and rotating. You do me such an honor. Well, it has to have front placement. Uh, uh, Nidus, uh, give me an insight check. Okay. Oh, that's a cool, 24. Oh, wow. You clock a bunch of wizards around the party looking at this tree going, fuck, and like looking at like <laughs> a like nicely wrapped jewelry box and being like, what the fuck? Yeah. <laughs> nice, nice. I, I see business is booming. Oh, loquacious, <laughs> indeed. Wow. Here at the replenishment, the Golden Scythe and Avalia along with it have never been better. Amazing, I, I you know, I, I've been uh, balancing some new sponsors. Oh. Maybe, uh, maybe we could talk about sort of, uh, you know, sharing some details. Maybe, maybe you could even. Um, I was thinking on on your little automatons. Yes, that you yes. Have. Uh, the hot me dots. If if what I could. Hot me dots. Did I say it right? Yeah. If we oh, worked out, no if we worked out a deal, <laughs> could I slap like a logo on some of them? If I got uh, just like a little. Oh, like a oh, we could fee definitely work something out okay. like that. Well, I think we would. Maybe um, continue this conversation at our table in the back. I don't want to lose course. it. I see Laren coming. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. You guys start. Uh, you guys start walking and talking. Yeah, you see a bunch, of, uh, a couple of Hadmadads follow behind you, sort of we'll flopping with their fabric. Because certain parts of the city, I think we're going to have to charge a bit more for that kind of placement. <laughs> Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, Laren is uh, walking up. Uh, there's no like, she's wearing like a liquid gold dress that looks like a cauldron of bubbling molten gold. Mm. But the like, it's that weird uh, apparition where it looks like the background that she's walking across has the feature. So as she's walking, uh, that's where the source of the pattern is from. So it's just like a weird uh, like visual. Uh, cool. But other than that, she didn't really think of uh, like adorning herself. She's too excited, and she's just walking up. Uh, she's got this little like golden. It's like a, a like a wizard fidget spinner in her hand that she's kind of just snapping back and forth. That's made of like this delicate like gilded metal, uh, and she's just sort of mumbling to herself, very excited. Uh, all of the energy is like I'm coming here to make an appearance, and then I have to go get to work. Mm. Incredible, um, uh, Laren. With that energy, you uh, and you you walk into the Palazzo Porco. Uh, the herald announces um, uh, as you enter this place. Architect Arcane of the Court of Workings, Hierophant Abjura of the. I cast haste on myself, so I'm down at the bottom of the stairs as he's. <laughs> yeah. You guys, you guys, you hear that the like, pre-recorded announcement is like Hierophant, <laughs> and like speeds up. Uh, you get to the bottom. My, Mark haste. Um, <laughs> my hair just yeah. like goes whoosh as she darts past me, and I'm like, Yo. Okay. 
Uh, incredible. Uh, Laren, uh, you go to the bottom and meet with that haste, breeze past people. You're also a person that, like, unlike um, Loquacious and Nidus, have to get to that table quick because people know they can get things from these two. S like, civilians don't understand what you do enough to ask you for stuff. So you're actually safe to just approach Pesha out in the open if you want to. Uh, I pass by you. Uh, grab a glass of champagne and come back over. Uh, I have two. I replace yours. Mm. Hey. Hi. Hi. So glad to see you could join us. Incredible news. What? Uh, uh, later. Now, not. Bye. And she just takes off again <laughs> towards the back. <laughs> Forgot to drop haste. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Too bad. Too bad. Uh, Larry, you zoom off. And uh, Xerxes. So, uh, so, so Xerxes uh, was not actually planning on showing up because mm. these kinds of events, he's he's not, you know, this is his first time as first knight, and was not really into uh, 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 the first return as first knight, mm. and was not um, was kind of dreading this sort of a public thing. Um, but uh, a, a question for, for yeah. back back when the kites were flying. And yes. Xerxes was on the balcony. Oh. Did I get one? No. Okay. Um, uh, so then what Xerxes would have been doing is he would have then um, uh, gotten on top of uh, Tempest, flown out and done a round uh, in the distance to make sure everything was clear and was going to use that as his excuse to stay out there, but um, decided otherwise. And you see uh, the griffin just soaring down into the entranceway, and kind of in one smooth motion, as the griffin starts to slow down, Xerxes hops right off and plants his two feet onto the ground, mm -hmm. sending Tempest out mm -hmm. to scout, be his eyes yeah. uh, uh, in the sky, and takes a deep breath. I just extend the glass of champagne that Laren handed to me that I haven't taken a sip from yet. So Xerxes, oh wait, no, you didn't walk through the door. Oh, I'm but, starting to oh, walk through, oh, yeah. and it's, uh, yeah, I'm starting to walk. I, la I landed in, I mean, I wish. Yeah. That'd be, do, do, do. That'd be cool. uh, uh, <laughs> right at the entrance, and then starts to like march in. Yeah. So Xerxes Ilrez, first knight of Avalia. And he freezes, because that is terrifying to him, to be announced in front of all these people and have perhaps eyes on him. He's just like, oh, oh. the complete opposite of this, he's probably frozen in his tracks, like, let me ask you a question. So you scouted and looked down at Kath Moira. Did you land in Kath Moira or no? No. Okay. I didn't want to be seen, but I wanted to, I, I, w I was looking from in, a distance. In the, in the home of Edelis Okira, uh, even from that great height, you could see that the lights were on and uh, a small feast was being held. Um, I will say this as well, Nidus, mm. uh, you receive a longer missive than the one from your brother from your sister-in-law, Irme, um, who informs you of, you know, some, a little bit more than pleasantries, some family news and things that have been occurring and things that will maybe require your attention, not on a professional, but on a personal level, some friends that have come calling. Mm -hmm. Uh, and at the end of her letter to you, she says, um, basically, uh, as she speaks to you, she says, Romar and Ramira are fine. Uh, Romar is planning his, you know, adventures upon growing older, and Ramira is already completing her studies and ready to apply to some of the universities in Avalir. Um, Elias is well. Most days are fine for him, but in the days approaching Avalir's return, I cannot report that his mood has been bright. I have done my best to instruct that he ought to send his father 
some word of kindness upon arrival. Please give Xerxes my apologies. Elias is at a tender age. Mm -hmm. uh, I was actually waiting for Xerxes. That was the last one. So cool. I start making my way uh, towards the uh, towards the entrance, and as I near the herald, I actually quickly and very stealthily sneak up behind him and s sneak just a finger under his throat. <laughs> and it has a gold piece in it, and I say, keep that name to yourself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll, sli I'll slip up just behind uh, Xerx. I was wondering if you were going to show tonight. Well, I wasn't planning on it, but uh, I've decided otherwise. What, how, what am I to expect here? I uh, I couldn't tell you, but I I do need to run something by you a little later, something a bit fishy. I'm ready to get out of this and talk about that immediately. I have to follow up on one other lead real quick. Uh, I'll see you at our table. Yeah, I just see like shoo, yep. and I. As you will arrive, patient, go ahead and describe your table, the fabled table we have heard so much about. Yes, I, I, I escort Xerxes back, now handing him the glass of champagne. And, <laughs> and uh, kind of hidden away in like a, an archway that's kind of got this open room with a few other kind of windows that can see out to the rest of the party. Um, hanging ivy and vines with a little uh, like water fountain embedded into the far back wall. There is a nice little round table mm. and some like booths on the side, you know, it's cushy. Yes. And uh, yeah, and then that's where we have our little private area. Charcuterie, cheese board on the table, mm. it's a must. Beautiful. Um, as you walk through the ivy, uh, the ivy rustles, approaching the table for those that are already here. As you walk and see Nidus and Loquacious already seated, um, you can hear as their mouths move just the rustling of ivy leaves. Uh, as you walk in and take a seat, and you feel a little wash of not not imposing, but a little wash of divinatory and abjurative magic. Just a little bit of, are you who we think you are? And if not, maybe I do something about it. Ha. Huh. Cool. Uh, but all who walk here are their honest selves, and as you sit at the table, beautiful charcuterie board set in front of you, all of you look out, protected, in this ivy silence, with all of the power of the flying city of Avalir at your disposal. You look out at magisters, deans, and provosts of the flying city, apprentices of the Ring of Gold, and the six people who actually get shit done may finally, after a long day's preparation, have a moment to celebrate. Where's uh, Sirit? I saw him with you. Is he was. Coming? He said he had something to take care of, and then he was going to come and join us at you know the spot. I'm <laughs> actually chasing down the rando that uh, Loquacious came with. Yes. Okay. <laughs> you go over. My best um, you go over, <laughs> and you see. Um, you see that. Uh, uh, you see that the uh, there is a there is a Hadmadad holding a small tray of drinks, and you see Bolo is there saying. I need drinks from you, not this. And you see that the Habitat's like, listen, I only have a small list of pre-programmed responses. I'm not actually sentient. So if I'm saying this, you know that you've asked for something that's not included in my brain. <laughs> Good evening. I know all the faces in this gen joint, but I, I don't seem to know yours. This bag is giving me a hard time. I'm sorry to hear that. I, I didn't catch your name. Bola. <laughs> Bola. Bola. I am, I am Seret <laughs> Agrupnin. My friends call me Pinch. Bola from. Aeor. <laughs> <laughs> Bola from Aeor. Mysterious. If you need anything, please don't hesitate to ask. Can I escort I you? I need the drinks. You need. <laughs> The drinks. This bag <laughs> keep arguing with me. <laughs> yes, it does. I hate it when they do that. 
Can you destroy? <laughs> I can sense your frustration. I'll be sure to take this up with the maker of this fine machine. Let me what, see what I can do. What do you mean machine is a bag? Yep. <laughs> I'll be back. I'll be back. Hood up. <laughs> I make my way down th through the thing. I go over to Loquacious. Who the fuck did you come with? <laughs> A blur of gold comes by. Who the fuck did you come with? Oh. And I take back off to go find them. <laughs> oh, you don't need to, Laren. She's she's just she's just some arm candy that was uh, offered to me by arm a candy. She threatened to expire the help. Too <laughs> sweet. Well, it's gonna be a fun night for me then. Oh. <laughs> I'm gonna grab that champagne from your hands. Laren, do you take I off my bolo? No, I'll I'll stay. Stay. Yep. you stay. <laughs> Friends, what did I miss? Oh, oh, not much. We were just getting settled. <sighs> look at this. The first replenishment for the ring of brass. <laughs> Feels right. Oh, that's a good point. It's a momentous day on a lot of uh, fronts, but uh, I feel like there's there's news to share. I, I not for me. I of course. I hear nothing, but I'm curious to know what the news is, well, so that I... Before we do, though, perhaps a toast to our friend Xerxes as yes. his first... Oh, that's right. First uh, uh, night of Avalir going into a replenishment. To the first night. So the first night of the first yes. night. I had a drink, it was taken back. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, I would like to uh, toast um, those that are not with us as well, um, to yes. Evandrin, who who should be here in this place, in this position of honor, and who would have been handling that entrance with a lot more grace than I certainly did, but thank you all, my friends. I His appreciate you. His legacy will be long-lasting. Well, let's hope so. Um, I, I'm afraid I, 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 I'm, I'm going to have to cut through the pleasantries. I'm not in the best of state, and I almost didn't come, but something feels amiss to me. And I've been, I've come here to actually stick out the two of you. Um, you need, hold on, oof, been a minute. And I uh, take that like lethargy effect where I'm like, hold for six seconds. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry, what was it? Um, I just magically refill Laren's <laughs> glass of champagne. I had a bit of a nightmare of sorts last night, I suppose. Maybe it's my anxiety for coming home, maybe it's some nerves that I have from reuniting with my son, <clears throat> but uh, it seemed to, it shook me. And I didn't know what else to do but to come and tell you about it. Um, Evandrin was in my dream, and in it there was a fight of some sort between I can only say the gods. Oh. The father of the dawn seemed to be trying to extinguish what I could only say was one of the betrayers. Oh, um. Does this mean anything to anybody other than just perhaps a bad dream? Sounds silly to me, frankly. Dreams can be deeply interpretive, Xerxes. I mean, Perhaps it is your anxiety of the two colliding forces of Avalir reuniting. It felt, I understand, and the gods don't mean much to me. Good. But one was begging me for help. One of the gods? The fallen one, the betrayer. The, they're not here, though. Not like the others that walk around. I know you know that. Just I know that. What did the what did this betrayer look like? He was red, had a horn. And Does that? Uh, I think maybe. 
couldn't remember if it was because of the way he was lying down, but I just recall seeing the side of his face and maybe one horn. Maybe the, if there was another one, maybe it was broken off, I'm not sure. I'm not remembering it so clearly, but I do remember something that was said. Gordranus. Who here speaks Draconic? Here. Uh, I do as well. Throw it up, let's go. Ah. <clears throat> I knew you would. <laughs> uh, the Gathering of Shadows. Gordranus. It doesn't mean anything to you right now. Uh, anyone here who would like to uh, may roll, uh, you can roll history, you can roll arcana, or if you have, you know, are listening to your very troubled friend who you know is in a state of emotional turmoil and just want to roll an insight if you're not about. <laughs> what is that? What's it called? history or? Arcana, if you're like, okay, let me let me take him seriously, or insight if you're like, I want to. I'll do that. 12 I'll do for history. 12 for yeah. history. I'm, I'm, I mostly think it's emotional, but I will, Think about like these words feel more like relevant. Yeah. Which would you want from that? Um, if you're thinking about the words themselves, I, any of those intelligence skills, I would take religion, arcana, or history. I'll do arcana. Though. Do arcana, yeah. Twenty six on insight, and I want to. I just want to glean if he's really shook by this or if he's talking about something else. Ooh. Twenty nine on history. Let's go. And twenty two on arcana. Also twenty two on arcana. Twenty nine history. Twenty two on arcana. <laughs> 26 on inside. <laughs> okay, so for our, uh, we'll start with the 22s on Arcana. Um, Gordranus is a dra it's draconic. Um, you would know f from the Arcana check there that the term Gordranus, it is like those are, the, it, the literal meaning is gathering of shadows. Um, Words have connotations, right? And that's one of the hardest things when you're adopting a second language is to learn like the idioms and it's like, what's the, like if you don't speak English, what's the difference between a hearty welcome and a cordial reception, mm. emotionally? Like those words don't land the same. Dragons aren't scared of much. Gordranus, those words mean, the connotation is an intense one. It's the kind of words that dragons would use to describe something they were scared of. Okay. Um, with a 29 history check, an incredible history check, um, the name Gordranus comes to you from a very specific place in history. It's an ancient text from the schism. This is a text from when the primordials, so so th there's a lot of stuff about the schism in the librarium in Cantatum, right? because the founding of Toramunda has its root in the schism, right? Um, the Toramunda was founded when uh, the Emperor of Fire and the Empress of Earth that were two mighty primordials were laid low and sealed forever away by the Dawn Father under Mount Egora. And it was under, it was in the guise of that mountain that eventually the Druids of the Gaudrashari came and built Toramunda, tending to this, holy place, and over time, those druids tended to it so well that other people came and sought them out, and then eventually it grew into a city, and that city eventually attracted wizards, and those wizards eventually took the top of that mountain and sailed away. Um, but the name Gordranus from the early schism, because in the schism there were dragons fighting on behalf of the prime deities, uh, there was a threat made in the epics of one of these battles during the schism by the betrayer gods. It's attributed to different ones in different texts, but the most reliable, the text that at least, well, who knows, reliable, but the most detailed text that you remember from your encyclopedic knowledge of all of the scrolls of your library and all the tomes therein, uh, is that it's often attributed to the Lord of the Hells. And it is. Uh, and it was Gordranus. Is it's just it's just a very specific wording that he said in the battle of his defeat in the schism when he was sealed away, where he said like 
put me where you will, in darkness I will gather my shadows to me. Wow. Um, and Gordranus, in Draconic, the literal, so you're like, oh, that's some like, specific verbiage. It's, again, 29 is a super high roll, so that's you going like, well, that's literally where I've seen the words before. Right, right, it's like pulling a certain phrase out of a, Just a, key a word. Shakespeare, yeah. and not one of his popular ones. <laughs> yeah, it's like just keyword search, there you go. Um, and then for that, 26 insight. Yeah, he's seen so much. How, how shook is he compared to his life experience? You, this Arcana stuff, you know people. That's what you do. You find you are detective. You solve mysteries. Xerxes barely could stomach walking into a room and getting attention. The idea that this dude would would pop off on a like I had a dream that scared me to his like peers unless it was the realest shit in the world is laughable. In fact, I would send a 26 insight, and you can roll deception against it if you want, but in, if you are trying to be honest in this moment. I'm, uh, I'm not hiding anything. Um, you know the fact that he's telling you about this dream means there's 20 before that he didn't tell you about. Like the straw's already broken the camel's back. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, you can tell that there's something that was being contained that now can't be contained anymore, and it's gotta come out. <clears throat> uh, um, I don't know what it means, and I'm coming to you because uh, I normally taken to the skies will clear my head, and I can't get this out of my head. And I saw my son in the dream, and he was uh, five, which I know he's not now. But I. Uh, How um, old is he now, by the way? He's 13. Okay. He'll be 14 in a month and a half. Mm. And I don't know what he looks like. Oh, that's right, you haven't seen him since. I haven't seen him in seven years. Yeah. Was the last time you saw him when he was five? No, he was uh, about to turn seven. Oh, okay. It's the last time I saw him. Briefly, but um, look, I don't want to. I don't. I don't. I know that there's other matters that we have to attend to, but I just wanted to gather your thoughts. If any of this means anything to either of you, I recognize the phrasing. Um, I, Pesha explains what the DM just explains. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, perhaps this vision of the devil looking man, maybe he was the lord of the hells. Maybe you're having some sort of deeper connection with that moment in the schism. Hmm. Maybe. And you know, I don't know, as a father, maybe it's just some anxiety that I have over my son. Could be. Maya's seven now, Kier's five. Mm. It's strange that you mentioned where the shadows gather. There was a, a crime scene that was reconstructed in, from Vasselheim. Some of the language and symbols that were used there were both celestial and infernal. Strange to see both. Not my thing, but unusual. This is recent? Mm, very recent. Uh, you remember the, of course, the matron ascended. Many have tried to duplicate. Sure, yeah, we've told that story. Yeah, there's usually just uh, over SpaghettiOs all over the wall. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> this is the second time Vasselheim has come up in conversation for me today. Mm -hmm. I was hoping to actually ask you about it, but. Go ahead. Seems there was some sort of happenings. I heard 
rumor through the grapevine that there were some artifacts stowed away here in Avalir from Vasselheim. They mentioned that someone from the uh, Ring of Silver was asking about them, and I could only assume that that was you. I'll say, you not only, I've heard about people in the Ring of Silver talking about this, you, Loris was from the Ring of Gold. Hmm. Word travels fast through the rings. Who, who did you speak with about this? It only raises my suspicion because normally these things are passed off as a copycat. Someone trying to do what someone else has done with dire effect. But the remnants of this attempt, things don't quite match up. Certain things that are left behind weren't left anywhere. Any of this spark my memory, or, or any thoughts of something that would be familiar? I would add this. Usually if it's a failure, not a lot of people are interested in things that don't succeed, but where there's success, or so some remnant of it, that can draw a different crowd. The Ring of Silver, caring about this, Well, as you know, the library in Cantatum um, has a deep, vested interest in any type of extraterrestrial knowledge that should not be in the hands of dangerous people. So many, so many people. Perhaps it's just timing. I think there are a lot of things that have to line up in order for something like this to work. But, but it wasn't successful. Most of these, as you said, aren't. I wouldn't be the one to weigh in on that, but. How would you know about it if there wasn't something left over? Like, if there was nothing, then no one would know that anything had happened. So there's something. Is there something? Indeed, and I didn't want to detract too much from our champagne, but okay, there's a bow. <laughs> I, I pull out from behind my cloak, tucked in between where I, my wings are, the half of this uh, rusted, patinaed bow. Yeah. Can I look at it? I, oh, you, you sure can. You can. Even you. I uh, also wanted to get Zerk's eyes on this, but I, I take it, okay. Yep. Uh, okay. <laughs> I look at Nidus as well, just knowing that he has seen many an artifact. Yeah, I'll take a look at it as well. Yeah. Hell yeah. Um, yeah a, I'm sure approaching. Mm -hmm. Uh, every, so yeah, do do whatever roles you want to do, and if you want to do something like angled towards like whatever kind of role it is that you want to, whatever you're looking for specifically. But yeah, you see a piece of badly corroded metal, um, pretty heavy to the touch, and again, there's it's it feels in a place full of so much magic a little bit extra mundane, if that makes sense. Um, go ahead and give me arcana rolls or investigation rolls, or if you want to do some magic about it or use some class features, I'm also down for I that. I'm going to divine sense that mofo. Cool. <laughs> I'm going to let the experts handle this. Hell yeah. Uh, 22 arcana, and I guess I'm m more interested in the bow itself, yeah. origin, like the, the actual Magical item, its origins, less what happened to it oh, afterward. Cool. Yeah. Hell yeah. Uh, I got a 24 in Arcana, uh, inspecting it with the eyes of someone who is who runs the engine that breaks down magical artifacts mm. constantly mm -hmm. to like fill the batteries. As she's sort of looking at it, I'm just gonna do a, do something that I've done to her hundreds of times, but not in a while, and just sort of. Just gently oh. rub her shoulder oh and uh, inspire her. Oh. Oh. You want to throw some bardic inspiration on that roll? Go for it. Oh. All right. Uh, when you make contact, I think a little bit of her perfume kicks up, and it smells like Isilrin violet and petrichor, mm. which were the flowers at our wedding. Oh, oh. stop it! Oh. Stop it! Oh. So you get a d10. Oh my god! Thank you. Oh. We're all good. Okay. Those are five. Too adorable. Oh, hell yeah. 29. 29. Incredible. Um, uh, okay. 
<laughs> so there is a so. there is a moment. Uh, I think both of you are looking at this, right? Um, f- and and studying it for a moment. And I think Xerxes, y- you say the thing that kind of cracks it, where you do your divine sense and give everyone a hand into this. You're not used to seeing some of this, but the first thing you pick up as you guys start to inspect it uh, is for something this mundane, you've never experienced something like this. You reach out with your divine sense. It's non-magical. It's a rusted scrap of metal. And normally things divine presence kind of keeps a pace of their magical signature. This thing is utterly non-magical. So you're like, well, I'm, I might get like a whiff of something. <laughs> Powerful divine energy, specifically celestial. Yeah. Put it down, 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 put it down. Huh? Put it down. Why? There's something, something's going on with this. I'm sensing a very powerful celestial energy inside of it. Oh. Yep. <laughs> uh. <laughs> magical shit all day long. <laughs> I don't think that's magical. You don't want to argue with her. She'll always <laughs> um. win, or she'll say she did. <laughs> um, as. Not wrong. Well, then put your eyes back on it and tell us what you see. <laughs> um, as you look at it with that with that arcana, um, we'll come to the 29 first. So the first thing, because I think you also get a piece of information from Nidus. Uh, Nidus, you take a set of like master like tools out of your thing. Um, you hit this with like a tuning fork that you have that you use for it to like, like okay, it's rare metal. What's yeah. the metal? Um, it makes a weird note. On the metal, on the fort, the, the the one you go for the most often, which is gold, mm-hmm. right? It makes the right noise, but there's a weird tenor to it. Mm-hmm. And as you look at it, you look over the fragment of this bow. This bow was at one time twelve feet tall. Uh, oh, what? You can guess exactly what this is because the the t- the, the uh, all of you watch like Nidus like listen to this tuning fork. This is made of gold, mm. but it's not made of gold from any mine on Exandria, because this this is gold wrought from the heavens themselves. Mm-hmm. This is extra planar gold. Mm-hmm. You are what what your dear friend Laren is holding is the former bow of a solar, which is a type of angel. It is a like the highest angel's direct servant. Have I ever seen anything like this before? Or you, the, you get have to go through a process of elimination in your head to get here. There are jokes from like back back when you were on like a a pirate crew back in the day. Like there were jokes about different kinds of gold, and someone used to talk about there was some cleric that like ended up being captured by the ship briefly before they could get like ransomed back off to their clergy. That was talking about like bows of pure gold wielded by solars and a bunch of pirates would like laugh about like, <laughs> if I could ever get my hands on a bow of pure, <laughs> like, so in your head you're like, this is extra planar gold yeah. from a bow, and just you're familiar enough with all objects of great value that you're looking at the curvature and you're like, this is, this, if you complete this curve, yeah. it only makes sense in a bow. If it goes for another six feet. Yes. Yeah. 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 Right, yeah. exactly. I think you guys watched Nidus hit this thing and just for the next minute, it's just banging it. <laughs> <laughs> Incredulous. <laughs> Nidus. Yeah. Nidus. <laughs> This is of the heavens themselves. This is the bow of a solar. 12 feet in length. Pure celestial gold. (laughs) With that information on a 29, you put together the pieces that you've been given. Would, do you think that Sarah would have shared the forensic stuff from before about the nature in which this was dispelled? Yes. Laren, <laughs> you look at this. This, uh, as, as Nidus speaks, and you know exactly what to imagine in this place, 
um, you realize the reason you have a fragment is that the bow at its center must have been shattered. And the only thing I can say is your that incredible arcana as you feel as tough as the last few years have been the reassuring presence of Loquacious nearby, who is himself more than a mortal man, you look at this thing and realize it was shattered. In your head, you immediately go to Mage's Disjunction, ninth level spell, something that could have destroyed that. You look and look and look at this. You know how to look for the residue of a spell. This, first of all, the bow of a solar could not be dispelled by a mortal mage. And not only that, you think that this wasn't a spell. Something deeper and older and more profound than a spell happened. You know for a fact that nothing Vespin Chloris did or ever could have done could have done what happened to this. So the question that your mind immediately goes to is, Vespin didn't do this, so who did? Because when he tried whatever he tried, perhaps very quickly there was someone or something else in the room with him. And its mere presence took the weapon of one of the heaven's mightiest warriors and shattered it without effort. Two things happen sort of simultaneously. Uh, even as uh, Lairin like explains that to the group, she begins to like pocket it harder. And I want to ask you, mm -hmm. the rules for interplanar travel usually require a bit of metal something that you can attune to where you're headed. Yeah. Would this count? It has lost all of its innate magic, but spell components rarely need to be magical. This would absolutely work for that. And I think even as she explains it uh, and is very fearful and kind of gives you like a furtive look at what could be powerful enough to do this right away, she can't help but smile that she has the last thing that she needs. <sighs> Announcing the champion of the Matron of Ravens, Pervon Su! Oh, shut oh. your fucking <laughs> mouth, Brennan <laughs> Lee Mulligan! <laughs> um, and you see, walking- What? <laughs> Do you see? Very important figure. Right? <laughs> <laughs> the reaction to the table. <laughs> yeah, I yell, oh, like, what? <laughs> parts the ivy a little bit so we get a good look. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you see, <laughs> uh, walking uh, through the doors of the Palazzo Porco, no. uh, a young man, long dark hair, light brown skin, severe. Grave expression on his face. <laughs> oh, this guy. Oh, the <laughs> this guy. And you see, he's got a wolf with him. Yeah. <laughs> um, walks into the party and hush goes over the gala as in this age of Arcanum, a champion of the gods has walked in. What a quaint and wondrous thing to behold. Uh, the man who walks in bears terrestrial mud on his black leather boots. He walks in the stoic countenance of a ranger, and you see beside him a black and gray wolf stride in. He looks around sullenly, a mantle of raven's feathers around his neck. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> He's not clad in armor, though. You do not see him clad in armor. Uh, oh, interesting. Uh, oh, of course. <laughs> oh, shit. Okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Oh, I'll tell you after. Uh, <laughs> hey, uh, why would any kind of special armor nope. be needed in this wonderful yeah. age of Arcanum? Sure, sure. He's just a guy. He's just a guy. Mm -hmm. um, Put on his boots. Uh, uh, walks oh, in, um, uh, and you you see uh, this young man walk in. I will tell you, uh, uh, out of game, truly, this guy's like probably like seventh or eighth level. He doesn't. Ha he's not glowing with uh, okay. tons of. Yeah, he's not. Up. He's not. Do we all know who he is. No. Ah, okay. Uh, uh, this guy got requested from somebody. Um, you see that um, uh, Madara Glyph walks up and approaches your table and gestures to you, uh, Xerxes, and uh -huh. says, ah, "My lord, uh, Sir, Sir Ilres, <laughs> my apologies. Um, I wished to introduce you. There is quite a curiosity here. Uh, a terrestrial <sighs> champion of the matron of ravens <laughs> has arrived, and I wished for him to meet Abelia's yes, of course, of first course. night. <laughs> I will. Uh, I will be right there. Uh, one moment, please. Very well. <laughs> I don't want to show that we're so earnest. Of course, I meant only to say because he himself is a is a champion of the of, of the Raven Queen, yes. and of course our champion is a draws on di uh, divine source without, of course, needing any <laughs> deific intermediaries. So, I will make sure that he is aware of my presence. <laughs> <laughs> And she so amped. <laughs> she wanders off. Uh, can I snap uh, for two hobbadobs? Yeah. Uh, clean the man's boots. <laughs> this is the Palazzo Porco. <laughs> Thank you. Right, you are, sir. And you see, uh, uh, they issue hobbadobs. So you see this guy walk in, look around, kind of sullenly at everyone here, uh, and two brightly colored magical scarecrows come up and start mopping his feet, and he goes, <laughs> I beg your pardon, and starts to like move, and you see <laughs> that Galdric oh, like snarls at the Hadmadads, uh, but also Galdric is like, do I bite this suit of empty clothing that's floating <laughs> around? Um, yeah. uh, so. Yeah. Well, this is uh, oh, such a weird turn of events, we've got God stuff going on left and right here. Now there's a God guy in, mm. in your house, and mm -hmm. here, here's my takeaway from all this. I don't know how it's all related, and I'm desperate for you all to figure it out. But <laughs> one of my new sponsors yes. is the Market of Wonders, and maybe I could get them to sponsor like a, 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 a two or three article series about uh, you know how the gods are among us or something like that. You know the wonders of the gods meet the the, the market of wonders or something like that. I don't know. I'm spitballing. I'll keep working on it. You guys figure out the, the nitty gritty of the connections here. It definitely feels like it could be something. Uh, but I don't, there is something the the, cel the celestial the the the, pro the prophecy sort of uh, sensation you're describing in your dream it does make me wonder about should we consult with the hall? Is it the hall of prophecy? The hall of prophecy. The hall of prophecy. I mean the the oracles there. Might be able to help uh, illuminate some of the meaning of well, your dreams. Well, I heard they're taking a little twenty-four hour respite because they're tired or something. I didn't hear that. <laughs> Why didn't I hear that? I don't know. Actually, I was going to ask you there, and they heard they're they're just not responding. Laren's trying to cram that bit of metal into her clutch. <laughs> <laughs> um, Stupid tiny bag. Too loquacious, and Laren. It's strange that you haven't heard that the Hall of Prophecy yeah, is closed. Weird. That's very weird. It's, so it, it, it is closed? I mean, or, I, I haven't heard anything about that. I was just like, you know, I don't understand why they can't just wait another like 24 hours till after the replenishing to take their would little know, vacation. They're also, the prophets, when, when they take a day off, they, they would know about it in Is there a precedent yeah. for that? Has that ever, ever right, happened before? Uh, there is no precedent for this. All right, well. Well, we should probably go and check it out. Yes, we should. Us ourselves? Well, yes, I mean, well, I, I have a lot of thoughts with regard to the yeah. replenishment we and should. other we things, should. so. We should. Well, I want to go and have a word with this champion, at least. Oh, yes. Sure, do you need some backup? Do you need I some? would like some extra eyes, yes, in case you stand, notice something that I don't. We'll all stand nearby, kind of in a loose circle. <laughs> right. 
that surround him actually. Yes, you yes, know. Surround him and step it. in. Yes. <laughs> yes. Don't break eye contact with him. <laughs> yes. I wouldn't mind knowing who invited him in particular, unless you know, Patia. Oh, yes, he's a guest of a member of the Silver Ring, um, Mage. Hall, Magistrate yes. Hollow. Or this is the Dean Lycretia Hollow. Dean Lycretia Hollow. Fuck yes. <laughs> Dean Lycretia Hollow, and what is their area? Necromancy. Uh, they are the Dean of the Throne of Necromancy. Okay, well of course that would be the one to invite him. Um, I'm going to then step outside of our little field. Um, As you all go over to approach, I mean, it is sort of, it is a, Curiosity, certainly. Yeah. Um, you see uh, Lycretia Hollow along with Madara Glyph and the Magister Micah Cormorant, Speaker of the Fourth, um, have all sort of gathered around uh, this young man, Purvan Sul. Uh, and you, as you approach, you can hear the Magister say, Surely some great distance traveled on foot, no less. I can't imagine. It's, Quite a journey. And how long have you sworn this devotion to uh, the radiant eminence, the, the matron of ravens? Pervon looks out and goes, Many long years have passed in the service of the Raven Queen, my mistress. I have come to speak on matters divine to the Septarian. <laughs> oh. Of course you have. You want to talk to us. <laughs> um, you see that uh, there is a ruffle of polite laughter, and this guy looks pissed and sad <laughs> at the <laughs> at the like look of sort of derision. Um, you see, he says, mm. "He's like, I understand that the Septarian is the ruling council of Avalir. Is this not correct? My understanding is that a number of." Artifacts may have been brought here in to the city. You see, everyone sort of looks around, confused at each other. He says, "The Septarian is what I must speak with." I'm, I'm going to approach and try to break this up. And I, I, right I, I, I was about to start talking shit, so that's good. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> start talking. Yeah. Um, and and oh. I, I kind of, I kind of got there in time to to to, to overhear some of this. And mm -hmm. and uh, Xerox is. is um, kind of stroking his uh, uh, his beard. He has a beard, mm -hmm. and in the front there's like one tightly braided, longer kind of uh, uh, lock, um, and he's kind of stroking that as he's taking in this champion and um, steps forward and he says, um, "Champion of the Matron of Ravens." Yes. You see, he bows his head respectfully to you. First night of Avalir. First night of Avalir. Yes. Shall I um, escort you away from your audience? Uh, you see Madara looks and says, <laughs> Sir Ilres, please, well, well, listen, well, I, I, I say, Madara. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. And you see that um, she looks off, uh, Pervon looks at you and says, I, uh, I appreciate the offer. I would ask if, I, I know that you serve the Septarian yes. directly. Um, you see, as he speaks, Galdrick kind of nuzzles up against his leg. You see that as Madara goes silent, Magister Cormorant speaks up. And you see, he says, uh, Champion Pervon. And you see, Pervon looks over and says, You may refer to me simply as Champion. Oh my God. Uh, and you see that, uh, you see that he says, uh, Well, uh, I think it quite telling that you should know that our first knight, Xerxes, is a, a wielder of divine magic with no devotion to any deity to speak of. He has mastered the ability to call upon the divine simply as a champion of the people of Avalir, and perhaps. I'm I'm watching yeah. uh, Pervin, and just wanting to see how all of this lands on him. I'm not even looking at the Magister that's talking. Pervon is is sort of taking it in. You give me an insight check if you want, yeah. Sure. Sure. Uh, 17. Um, he, you can see Pervon 
is deeply uncomfortable and does not wish to be here. Mm -hmm. um, you see that a Magister Cormorant uh, simply says, um, I simply think it interesting. You know, there's been so many upheavals in recent history. You yourself, the champion of a new deity, and uh, our champion, <laughs> not needing a deity whatsoever. Uh, and you see there's sort of some polite laughter. Uh, uh, you see Lycretia Hollow looks over at you, Patia, and says, um, it is so striking, champion, that the matron of ravens ascended to the heights of divinity, but saw fit to, of course, erase her magical research. We live in an age in which knowledge, as our Keeper of Scrolls can attest to, is shared. It seems rather interesting that the greatest arcane achievement of the age would be uh, erased. Feels somehow not in the spirit of the age. Um, Who's saying this? This is uh, Dean Hollow of the yeah. College of yep. Necromancy. Um, Pervon looks out and says, I do not care for this conversation, nor to continue it. It's the only conversation you're going to get, so maybe you pipe up. The knowledge won by my mistress was hers and hers alone, and hers to do with what she willed, and she did as she willed in her ascension and in the acts to follow. I serve the goddess of death. Uh, and you see he turns and walks away, and you hear Dean Hollow call out, she is still one of us, though, is she not? And he stops here says, she was one of us. She does remember from whence she came. It is not their world any longer. Why would she not welcome us behind her? Pervon leaves the room. Can I start applause? <laughs> Now this starts applause, and the entire. <laughs> I use this applause to mask a message mm -hmm. to Pervon, mm -hmm. and I say, "If you wish to hear more, meet in the room behind the vines." Amazing, um, cool. Pervon leaves in the direction Xerxes that you pointed. Great. Um, what is everyone doing right now? Like in this sort of applause. Uh, as the dean of the College of Necromancy effectively claims a member of the Prime Deities as still being on the home team. Hmm. Uh, Laren is going to like start walking for the door, but I do uh, use my, uh, my bracelet to send ascending to uh, Nidus. I need four automatons in the heart right now. I have what I need, <laughs> and I have very little time. Oh, uh, uh, yes, yes. Uh, 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 uh Nidus, uh, is buzzing. Um, um, oh, uh, who do, uh, who's the, cl uh, I grab a hob, <laughs> I, I grab a hobadop, yeah. I grab a hobadop, uh, and I just write down four automatons to heart this instant. Uh, this needs uh, to be in the hands of Alessandro uh, as quickly as possible. All right, you are, sir. <laughs> he rolls into a ball of fabric and flies out the window. <laughs> just like flattens himself to be just like a, a like pain, like, like kind of magic carpeting off. Um, uh, uh, and takes off into the city. Um, Laren, you head off to the heart of the city, I yes. assume? Um, incredible. Walking out? Uh, I'll send you a sending on the way out that just says thank you and take off. Uh, incredible. Um, so I want, I need to do it, because it seems like there's a big moment at this party, people are scattering. Yes. There was some talk about the Hall of Prophecy. Pervon is still sort of like walking away in a state of religious offense, mm -hmm. right? Um, 
uh, and uh, uh, where, so where, so you're heading to the heart. Where else yeah. is everybody headed? I do want to ask Dean Hollow one yeah. question. Yeah. Uh, after he sends off Pervon in a, in a huff, I'll just have to have him say. Or this is, sorry, Lycretia Hollow is a woman. Oh, sorry, Lycretia Hollow, thank you. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I'll just uh, approach and say, well done. <laughs> you represent the city well. I, uh, <laughs> I find it strange that you would care so much about anyone replicating what the matron did. No one has ever come close to such a feat, correct? Uh, give me an insight check. Let's go. Uh, 23. Uh, wait a minute, what's your, what's your plus to insight? 13. Cool. Um, ba, ba, ba. um, so she looks at you and says, Actually, uh, I have a wait a yeah. minute. I have... uh, yeah, she looks at you and says, I'm sure I haven't the faintest idea. And the ring on your hand gloves pulses. <gasps> oh my god, let's go. Cool as fuck. <sighs> cool. There it is. Mm. There it is. Fair, very fair. I hope you enjoy the champagne. I'm sure there's lots of it. Uh, you walk away seeing the silver circlet around her neck, marking her as a member of the Ring of Silver. Can I pull Patia for a dance real quick? Mm-hmm. Oh, that's so good. <laughs> uh, we adjourn to the dance floor, uh, uh, and I say, uh, Patia, yes. I must ask, mm-hmm. you know that I am happy to make allowances for certain Members that are perhaps not entirely um, recorded uh, in the guild records, of course. You yes. need not remind me. <laughs> yes, <laughs> though I must ask. Everyone up until this point has been someone of influence and someone who I was happy to do a favor for. However, today I was visited by uh, Magister Cromwell. Uh, this would, have, I believe, is actually was Milus. Oh yes. Myla's friend. Myla's friend. Uh, today I was visited by a low-level magister, Myla's friend, asking uh, for the same sort of allowances that I've been giving out to uh, members of more esteem. So I must ask, have you been uh, offering my services to members so low as he? Do I recognize his name? Uh, give me a history check. <laughs> Well, my history's okay, 18. Oh, wow. Um, Circle's been breached. Myla's friend's not one of yours. Um, There might be some people who need to forget some stuff. Mm. This name does not ring true in my head in the slightest. Mm. And I know everyone. Uh-huh, and I'm going to uh, spin her away. <laughs> and I walk this. away pissed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Who the fuck is this guy? Uh, and I'm going to go get four automatons, mm-hmm. for an, an additional four automaton, head back to the vault to get four more automatons, and follow, uh, head to the heart You're after all late. deep now. Amazing. I'm, I'm go- yeah. Well, there's the four that are going now, na- that hopefully the fabricator gets, and I'm going to make sure we get four additional uh, automatons. Ah, yeah, just in case. There's, just in case. Yeah, in smart, Redundancy. Smart. Redundancy, yeah. incredible. Um, no intercepts. The guild, ma- you take off on a palanquin of uh, automata, woo, rushing through the city. One last thing. Yes. Uh, uh, I write uh, Xerxes a message that I'd like to speak to him uh, before we land, at some point. Okay. Um, if you're hitting out, you you pass by me at some point because I'm trying to follow. Uh, uh, as am Brian. I. Yeah. yeah. Cool. So, uh, so you guys see Nidus after a quick dance with Pesha mm-hmm. is rushing out, surrounded by automatons. You see, there's a couple of crescent mo- uh, of Harvest Moon um, soldiers waiting for you outside as well. Yes. Um, they begin to swoop around you and make ready for some kind of business. Um, and you do see Xerxes and Loquacious on your way out. Uh, Xerxes. Yes. Uh, brother, I wanted to say that. Uh, your forthrightness has done us some good. You are a brilliant first knight, and in the position you deserve. Well, uh, 
Thank you, my friend. Uh, let me see if I can prove your words right. As I, uh, we need to speak later, but yes. I'm going to catch up to this guy. Yes, and I have business uh, of my own. Uh, yeah. Xerxes, keep up! Uh, 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 cool. Uh, Guildmaster cool of the Golden Scythe takes <laughs> off to go grab Automata. You're like going through Excelsior Square. It's a zoo. It's the eve of the replenishment, and you're like fighting through Excelsior Plaza to get to uh, to get to your Automata. Um, you rush down back to the heart of Avalier with a fragment of extra planar gold. Um, uh, you two are rushing off after Pervon, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, Pesha, you've just found some news about a little breach in the circle. So as Pesha is still at her party, standing under this immaculate tree mm -hmm. that that Nidus graced my presence with, and she's just kind of standing there, and it's like a, like one of those shots where um, you know she's still and everything is buzzing around her in, like in fast motion, and um, she casts detect thoughts, mm. and she's like ice cold in her face, just kind of almost like the fixture of this party, and she's just gonna go yes. bing, 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 and just yeah, yeah, yeah. bounce around wow. and just like wow. listen, yeah. yes. Yeah. Oh. Ooh, go ahead, I'm, go I'm gonna ask for an investigation check, and I'm gonna ask for it with advantage. All right. Yes. Uh... I'm gonna set a pretty low DC here. You got the psychic, you got the psychic power. We're Weak. Gonna, we're gonna need that low DC. Weak. Yes. Yeah, thank God. Uh, uh, twelve. Ooh, <laughs> twelve. Was it that low? <laughs> uh, <laughs> was it that low? Level fourteen. Um, yeah. You, um, <laughs> It'd be that way sometimes. <laughs> uh, you begin to move through the party. You're looking for. Uh, somewhat, like, I think you like zero in on Madara Glyph. You're like, you've been annoying the hell out of me recently. <laughs> and you see her like, I do love a gala. This way. And you see, you're like yes. zeroing in on her. Um, you're listening for someone. You're like, where did the circle get breached? Somebody here talked when they knew they shouldn't. Mm -hmm. um, you hear a voice in your text thoughts, but the voice is quiet. Like it's someone whispering to themselves in their own mind. Um, do you turn to look to see who it is? I just kind of look in the periphery, barely tilting my head as little as I can. As little as you can. Um, you see a wobbling Hadmadad who has stopped serving drinks. Just sort of wobbling there. Fuck this. Oh. <laughs> Not my little scarecrows. Whoa. I didn't bring. Because I, <laughs> I didn't mean to bring 700 the of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, sort of wobbling there. It's like not serving. See the, the, the tray? Kind of lists to one side and comes back. And you see, with your detect thoughts, these are uh, automata. They're not sentient. Listening through detect thoughts. Quadranus. Oh. And you see the tray clatters to the ground and the Hod Madad disanimates and is a pile of clothing on the floor soaking up the champagne. Um what? What is happening? Um I, I'm going to uh, clock this because I've been keeping track of not just uh, Dean Lacretia Hollow, mm -hmm. but also Bola's yes. bitch ass. And, <laughs> yep. and then, I, and I, then I, an automaton just yeah. dropping into fabric I imagine on the I floor. I would make eye contact yeah. with Sarah and be like, go. Yeah, like, yeah. 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 Uh, break on it. Like, yeah. Break on it. Cool. Oh, you yeah. you go grab that uh, that Hamadad, sweep it off the floor. See, a nearby mage is like, looks like that Hamadad's having a little too much to himself. Ha ha ha. Avalee! That's uh, my best friend. <laughs> Best friend. <laughs> his best friend. <laughs> Nothing's gonna cramp my style. <laughs> um, you see, um, you grab the Hadmadad, take off into the wings. So, Excelsior Plaza, into the heart, R run off into a back room with this disenchanted thing. You're still sort of holding court here. We cut to our two. Uh, outside, uh, following Pervon. Sir Sul, Sir Sul. Pervon! Champion. 
He turns to look at you when you say champion. <laughs> and I, uh, uh, um, I, 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 I meet him. I, I'm not running. I'm not trying to make it seem like I'm you running. Know, yes. <laughs> But I'm, I'm I'm stepping towards him with with a sense of authority. Yeah, Galdrick. You see the wolf. The wolf steps around and goes. Uh, the wolf growls a little bit. He turns around and says, <laughs> says, uh, uh, turns around and says, "May I help you?" Well, I've come to ask that of you. Please, please don't leave in a huff. Some of our uh, allies back there and. I don't even want to say allies. Some of the other guests were rude to you and arrogant. We just came to apologize. Go ahead, loquacious. Give me a persuasion check, and with Xerxes at your side, go ahead and give me it with advantage. I won't need it. Oh my god. Well, maybe. <laughs> with advantage? Yeah. Okay. 29. <laughs> yeah. um, the first one was only a 20. Uh, <laughs> Pervon turns to look at you and says, I fear you make your home in a nest of vipers, gentlemen. I cannot speak highly of my experience thus far in the City of Crowns. Well, uh, you're mistaken at least on one count. This is not my home. We are approaching it. And I'm ready to have a very different kind of conversation with you, if you are willing. Speak your mind, First Knight. What brings you here? You seem to have come with some urgency and some concern. Very recently, very recently, I have come into the awareness that my mistress feels a concern. Something is moving upon the face of Exandria. Something that for the moment eludes even her sight. Her counsel brought me to Vasselheim my search was drawn short when I arrived at the sanctum of Vespin Chloris. Did you meet him? No. He had gone missing by the time I arrived. But you arrived at the site where he attempted this, this rite? Here you see Pervon looks surprised. You just said something Pervon did not know. Oops. <laughs> I will cast Gift of Gab. Yes! <laughs> what a spell! Oh, what does that do? You'll I see. take it back. <laughs> yep. It's a. No you shit. Like over rewind. Yes, yep. It's rewind. Yes, yep. Yes, yep. Ooh. Um, you see, <laughs> he. <laughs> Uh, so you, you. So in other words, that is like a vision that you have of the future that is quickly drawn back, and you see he goes. Wow. Um, I cannot long remain in this place. My heart belongs back in Isilra. There are still answers waiting for me in Vasselheim. I came here to attempt to find reason amongst the mages of this place. There is precious little to find here. You may be incorrect about that. The mages can be helpful, but only if you know the way in which to, to approach them. We can help in that matter. If you give us some information, we can pass along to them. Be a conduit for your, your matron. I came to Vasselheim in search of answers, and I believe some answers may have come aboard your city back during its stay there. The auguries which I used brought me here, but with little detail in the way of what I sought, so I 
came to ask the aid of mages. What I can tell you in this moment. Here he stops to consider what he honestly feels like sharing in a city that he has some reason to distrust. He says, it is the belief of my mistress that something very reckless may have been attempted. Many have sought to recreate the miracle of my mistress's ascension. Foolishly, and it has ended poorly for them all, or at least for those powerful enough to begin what they could not finish. It is my belief, based on the counsel of my goddess, The Archmage Chloris attempted something wholly different. Not a recreation, but something new. Something much riskier and more foolhardy. Riskier than an ascension to godhood? The god of death that ruled over that domain, whose name my mistress sundered and removed from the fabric of reality itself. What complaint could he offer for his own demise that would not be hypocrisy? God of death, dying can hardly be said to be an aberration. It is my mistress's belief that Vespin did not orient his attentions in the direction of any of her or the counsel she keeps. By which I mean to say that she has already conferred with each and every one of the prime deities None of them felt an attempt on their domains or any of their power, and yet a ripple was felt. Aiming for a different sort of a god. We can imagine no other directions. If divinity was sought and none of my mistress's counsel could offer insight, I need not tell you there are precious few options left. Hmm. I will tell you this, friend. Hopefully, I have not given this wisdom foolishly. You understand the implications of what I now tell you. If we are correct in what Vespin's focus was, then it is deeply troubling, the lack of sight into what may occur, even more so. Forgive me, champion, I, I must implore you to speak plainly, and not in riddles. What do you think happened? And tell it clearly, please so that I, too, may be clear on it. Every mortal mage who has attempted to recreate the Raven Queen's ascension has attempted to do as she did. Right. Ascend. Yes. To a prime deity, strike them from their throne and take their place, erasing their name. Vespin is a better mage than any other who has attempted. And we know that he did not commit that same folly. We do not know for certain what happened, but having removed what we know did not leaves us afraid. 
Okay. And just so we're clear here, <laughs> you wouldn't be comfortable with like a one-on-one -on -one sit down interview, <laughs> or like a, just a, an exclusive, an exclusive. I could get some really great illustrations made. Good of luck you. with your pit of vipers. <laughs> I truly wish that we all may come out from under the shadow. And Free advice, change your first name. Um, you see, <laughs> he goes, it's normal where I come from, and you see, he, uh, he, he, he uh, turns, uh, his wolf vanishes in a, uh, a blur of magic as he, in a movement of raven's wings, vanishes and disappears. I'll pick up one of the raven feathers that fell on the floor. <laughs> Hmm. That guy um, needs a PR makeover. <laughs> <laughs> he left quite the impression. What I don't understand is why he didn't just say that he attempted to ascend to the place of a betrayer god. He, he, he's not ascending, he's descending. He's trying to awaken a betrayer god and. To take him, to take their place. Awaken them somehow. Awaken them. Yes. Yes, give them some sort of volition to break free of. Wherever they are, I don't know. Do God knows what? Well, God knows what, huh? That's hello. That's a good title. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, we're we're going to cut from here. So. Thankfully, you guys have uh, scattered the party, which is great yeah, for me. Great. Uh, love that. Yeah. Um, um, Sarah. The top bubble. Um, you find a, you find a quick room to yourself. Quiet, off to one side, small chamber in the Palazzo Porco. Uh, as you look at the Hadmadad disanimated, uh, what do you do? Like, do, uh, uh, describe to me uh, what it is you want to do. So uh, I have an ability that allows me to uh, an eye for uh, detail. It, it allows me to make a perception check, spot a hidden creature object to make an investigation to uncover or decipher clues or anything that might be yeah. hidden. So I'll, I'll, I'll spread it out on the, on the floor, Yeah. Uh, but then take a step back above it, my, my crest starts to, to feather out, and uh, I'll, I'll take a look just at first at what I see and then push in closer. Mm -hmm. um. You take a look closer here. Give, go ahead and give me an investigation check. Okay. And I'll, I'll also, just because, uh, I'll also use uh, unerring eye, which allows me to sense the presence of illusions, shape changers, not in their original form, or other magic designed to deceive the senses within 30 feet. So investigation. Oh, Jesus. Uh, yeah, that's a 31. Ooh. Good, good kind of. Okay. Oh, dirty, that's a dirty 18. Yeah. Let's go, sir. Um, you look at this Hadmadad down on the ground, disanimated. Something's wrong. And on a 31, you're not alone in this room. Invisibility is a pretty beloved power. It's easy to get, even very junior mages can master it. The problem with invisibility is light is very important for a number of functions. And no matter how cloaked you might be in it, you can't make your whole self invisible, even if it's smaller than a pinprick. You need just enough of your eyes to stay visible that light can hit them and you can still see. Now, perceiving a fraction of a pupil hanging in space, smaller than a grain of sand, would be beyond most people. But you've been trained to look for them because they always move in two. Amazing. Unlike your eyes. Um, right. yeah. um, <laughs> uh, you look up in a mirror in the chamber, and you can see behind you, smaller than grains of sand, they're 
two pupils. I go about my normal business, bring my eyes down from the mirror, continue with the items, and I will uh, slowly reach under my arms yeah, and unsheath uh, both of my hawks. And as fast as I can, I'll spin and not only draw both of the hawks, but my wings <laughs> come out. Uh, for the first time in this campaign, go ahead and give me an attack roll. Oh, um, yeah! uh, and you can go ahead and give me a stealth. You don't even need a bonus action for it, but give me a stealth uh, to see if you can hide the drawing of the axes. Uh, 21 for stealth. Okay. Copy that. Okay. Uh, go ahead and make the attack roll with advantage. With advantage. Oh my god. Oh. <laughs> uh -oh. That's, it's 18 both times, so a 25. To hit. You absolutely hit. You are going to roll sneak attack on this. Oh shit! Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh, what is that? Six. Is that eight d sixes? It's seven d six. Seven. Oh god. Oh. Uh, okay, so that's twenty four points of damage. You rolled one six. Ooh. No, I know. I did it on. I did it because oh, yeah. I, I mean I could yeah. do seven. You know no, what? No, 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 no. No, You know what? I have him here. Do it, do it, do it. Why not? Yeah, I should just yeah, do it. Yeah, yeah, come on. Let's hear the noise. I've never rolled this many noise. fucking. Yeah. Old Let's go. Okay. Eight, do that math. Do that. Fifteen. Math. Fifteen. Uh, Twenty-three. Twenty-five. Twenty-five hey, points. Hey, what's yeah. <laughs> Um, you whip around. Um, you see where the eyes are, so you don't need to even see where the neck is. If the eyes are that far apart. Right there. Uh, the first thing that becomes visible is the blood hitting the wall, and you hear the drop before the spell fades. Oh my god! Yeah. Um, this person went from being invisible to being dead and didn't have time to register what was happening. You see a body materialize out of invisibility. Chunks of skin carved off of a shaved head. Lips carved off of a face. What? Wearing rags covered in infernal runes. A mortal man who nonetheless is stitched together with orange irises and bloodshot eyes staring out of a dead face. You hear behind you from the mirror. You will never reach the Wild Mother's embrace in time. Are you looking for something? You turn around, and in the mirror you see a shape in mist, swimming in the fog, in the mutilated face of Vespin Chloris. <gasps> <laughs> uh, reaches forward, hits the other side of the mirror, the glass cracks, and the face is gone. And the crack remains as you see your own image behind the shattered glass in the reflection. And that's all for this episode. That's all for this episode of Xandria Unlimited Calamity. And tune Lord. in next week. Let's see if things get better. Sure. Oh. <laughs> what? You get it, bro? That's the sign-off we do, oh, do, we do, do I do more? Should I, I do know. more of a story? Do you want me to do more of a story we'll about that? We'll see you next week. We'll see you next week. Bye. That's all. Oh, we had, we had with, uh, is it Thursday? Oh, is it Thursday? <laughs> yeah. There you go. There you go. There you go. Is it Thursday? Oh, I love it.